Hi, everyone, and welcome to this broadcast, The Healing and Freedom Journey. Mark DeJesus here, your brother from another mother, bringing you insights along the way. I'm all about mental, emotional, and relationship health. And if you are too, you have arrived at a great place. Today is a special edition broadcast that has been a long time in the making. I've spent a lot of time preparing this and putting it together. My goal is to provide it in such a way that will be helpful for your journey to encourage your learning, to encourage your empowerment. And it has to do with the subject of the Christian mental health and medication. Many just ask themselves in their journey, the question comes up, should I just go on medication? Is medication wrong for a Christian? I feel like I'm struggling with my mental health. Is medication the answer? These are common questions that arise when Christians are working through their battles, they're working through mood issues, their thoughts, their emotions, and they feel like they're in a tough place and they're being stretched and challenged and don't know where to turn in a world where there are so many opinions and perspectives. How can we make decisions about medication and mental health in a way that is fruitful and grounded for our journey? Now, as Christians, I believe that God has a way for us to experience healing and freedom, and that includes mental health, which involves healing how we think, how we process emotions, how we relate to others in relationship. Along the way, the subject of medication may come up as a possible way to help, and there's many questions involved. So I want to address this subject in a way that's compassionate, gracious, but also illuminating and helpful. It's my deep conviction that we need to be discerning, not in fear, not in panic, not in spiraling, but in sobriety to understand the helpful paths for each of our journeys. And this includes the area of what role should or could medication play when it comes to mental health. Keep in mind, What I'm sharing here today is meant to add value to your journey. This is not meant to replace professional help that you are getting, so please understand that. I'm a brother from another mother, but I also have years of my own experience and years of helping people, decades of seeing the trenches of what people are battling and rolling up my sleeves and walking alongside many, many people. And so I believe I have a lot of value I can add to your journey. But allow me to speak from a pastor's heart, from the experiences I've had, my own passion, because I love the research, I love the learning, I enjoy it. There's a grace on my life in this area to be a shepherd over these topics and these subjects that people battle and use the grace of teaching to be a help. And so that's my goal in this. Now, I want to tell you up front, there's some challenges that I face in addressing this subject, and I want to be honest about them. The first is that medication can be a a very emotionally charged subject. It brings up the pain, struggle, and heartache that people have, what they've been through. It brings up very difficult challenges that people have been through. It can bring up the shame that Christians may have when it comes to their mental health journey. Many spiral over the subject. I get a lot of emails of people spiraling about this area of medication, whether they should be on it, whether they shouldn't. And this subject can get very intense and argumentative. My goal is not to create an argumentative approach. I don't believe arguments do a whole lot of good at all, but it's understandable because people are coming from pain. And so, my, my thing here is not to try to get into debates. My target is to speak to those who want help, who want to see this subject with sobriety, and want to find the best pathways for their healing and freedom journey. With that in mind, there are a lot of black and white perspectives that come about that people get locked into, and it makes it challenging to talk about reasonable, nuanced aspects. I think one of the things we have to do in our learning journey is um, be open to understanding and not just get so locked into something. For example, Christians that say no one should take medications for anything, right? And they can get locked into that. They can do danger to themselves and to other people. Other people can often say, 
you talk about medication, let's say medication saved my life. And so this is the solution for me and it could be for other people. And it doesn't allow for, for nuance in the discussion and the journey. Many believers can be taught that if they take medication, they don't have enough faith or they are sinning. I want to talk about that a little bit more in this broadcast. Uh, meanwhile, when people who share those kind of viewpoints, they share that viewpoint of you, you don't have enough faith or you're, you're sinning if you take medication, they don't really give you a lot of helpful options of how to actually work through very difficult challenges of the mind, emotions. In fact, a lot of people who say those things, they're not very connected to their own emotions, nor do they help teach other people how to work through their emotions. So it actually leaves a lot of Christians stuck and in places of hopelessness, just weighed under that condemnation. A lot of times they just say, just, just renew your mind. Just have faith. Just stop thinking that way or get the devil out. And they don't really know how to actually invest in someone's life and help them walk through what renewing and healing looks like, which is why I've dedicated my life to teaching on these areas because I believe it is so needed. And to be honest, mental health has a lot of complexities to it. So I'm not about these silver bullet kind of answers that become very dismissive and leave people often very empty and how to process very complicated struggles that they're having. Now, this is a no condemnation zone. And what I mean by that is if you are on medication or have been on medication, condemnation does nothing for us. So that includes shame, guilt, regret, and all that stuff. I'm not about that. And I'm not about feeding that in any way. Um, now, people will say there's a lot of shame in taking medication around that subject. And I hear you on that. But I will say it's not as bad as it used to be. <laughs> when, when I was on psychiatric medication, besides my roommate, I did not know one person who was on medication for mental health. And I worked at a fairly large church of about 1,500 in attendance. Maybe they were all hiding. I don't know. Now, I came out with my story and more people started coming out of the woodwork of, hey, I've got that battle too. Hey, I've got that battle too. So more and more over the years, people are feeling freedom to share their struggle, to share what they're going through. Now, 20 something, what are we going, you know, we're, I'm talking about the, the 90s. Now today, I think it's pretty common that Everyone watching this or listening to this, you know someone that's on psychiatric medication or multiple people. And so when I look at people who have applied for coaching or, or help or personal one-on-one -on -one help, the, the majority are on some kind of psychiatric medication, if not multiples. So I want to say within this, there's no condemnation. If we can talk about this subject with no condemnation, shame and toxic guilt, and even a sense of spiraling. Because in a lot of my broadcast people, they, they can spin and they spiral. Many have obsessive compulsive kind of struggles. So they do a lot of what's called spinning. They spin out. They hear something and they spin out. And so I want you to know that from my vantage and standpoint, there's no condemnation in this. But within that context, we have to realize we need to do some learning. And we need to be able to talk about things that is best process if we just remain sober because there's a lot of lack of knowledge. There's a lot of distortions and ignorance on this subject. So I, my heart is I want to walk this subject with compassion and grace, but I want to be honest and say there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of ignorance. And I bump, um, bump into it on a daily basis when it comes to understanding medication. We need knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And in a world where there is so much information available to us, it is interesting that at the same time, we're very much still unaware of what we need to know. Maybe it's because there's just so many voices and we don't know who to listen to. Or maybe in our ignorance, we don't want to hear something because we're afraid. And so fear causes an avoidance of maybe embracing some knowledge that we need. So my goal here is I, I want to treasure the truth. I, I love the truth. And the, the truth in Jesus Christ sets us free. It doesn't leave us bound. It doesn't leave us in torment. It doesn't condemn us, shame us. It leads to freedom. 
because that's who Jesus is. He is the embodiment of the truth. And so I have a hunger for the truth and understanding what's best for us as believers. I want to lovingly encourage sobriety of, hey, let's see it for what it is, not living in denial, but also not spinning and spiraling over a subject. See it for what it is. I also want to empower you. My prayer is in all my broadcasts, you'll feel or sense or gain a sense of empowerment. See, the Bible talks about sobriety, of seeing things through a sober lens. Be sober is uh, something the scripture says. In this context, I want to promote a spirit of reasonability. Throughout my broadcast, I always talk about being reasonable. I believe God himself is that. Come now, let us reason together, he says. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And if the God of creation can be reasonable towards us within our sin, then I believe we can be reasonable to each other. And so I want to encourage reasonable interaction to the people you talk to. Be a person that is reasonable to listen, to be slow to speak, and one to hear people out in their journey. Now, in the, in the pathway that I'm going to take with you today, there's a lot of things I'm going to bring up about pharmaceuticals, about the current modern lifestyle we live in, maybe even some things about government. <laughs> there's not much I can do about the medical community. There's not much I can do about government. There's not much I can do about the Church of Jesus Christ. There's not much I can do about advertisers or the narrative that is out there. My mindset is I can make a difference in people's lives one by one. And I believe that you can too. So a little bit about me. I want to um, let you know that I'm not your doctor. (laughs) And I'm not a doctor. Many times people ask me for my resume or my portfolio. My experience and training is in pastoral ministry. And yes, I have training I've exposed my life to when it comes to mental health. Uh, trainings that other mental health professionals go to. I do a lot of deep diving into research, more because it's my passion, not because I have to. But really, I bring a pastor's heart to everything in my coaching and my teaching. My passion is to bring a pastor's heart into mental health, bring the word of God into this subject so that our lives can be changed and transformed and helped. Now, my initials are MD, (laughs) but I'm not an MD. God's given a grace on my life, and I enjoy, and I'm happy to be able to be a support and encouragement to you, and I'm going to bring my voice of what I've seen and what I've learned, and uh, I'm blessed that even though I don't have necessarily the portfolio of others who could uh, have their list of credentials that they apply, I've received very positive feedback from therapists, from psychiatrists, from psychologists. I'm not trying to be them or replace them, but it's an honor to hear many of them even recommend, hey, check out Mark DeJesus' materials. I've even coached and consulted people who are psychiatrists and who are therapists who are in that field, um, who are looking for help in their own journey. And it's an honor to be able to do that. I also want to let you know that I've been on medication. And so I'm not speaking this just purely from an outside perspective both for mental health and for other health issues. So I want to be very, very clear on that. Now, with mental health medication, there are two times in my journey that I've been told I should go on medication. The first time was many, many, many years ago in my 20s when I was, re- I was receiving therapy from a psychologist. And over time, after there wasn't necessarily a lot of improvement being seen, He recommended that I go on medication, which I then saw a psychiatrist, which moved to a 15-minute meeting, sometimes less, a prescription, and I would just go in and get checked on every now and then, just a quick 5-10 minute meeting, and uh, then moving on. I was prescribed Lexapro, which is an SSRI, and also Xanax, which is a benzodiazepine. And the Lexapro was taken on a regular basis. I can't I can't exactly remember how long I was on it, so I don't want to misrepresent it, but um, that was meant to be taken on a daily basis, and the Xanax was at times a go-to on the weekends in all my church activity and involvement. I'm kind of chuckling. Uh, It's not funny, but it kind of is to me 
that I need at times would utilize Xanax uh, on uh, the weekends oh, being my most anxiety ridden times. It took me quite some time to realize it took years and years for me to realize what I was actually dealing with was obsessive compulsive because I, I did not hear it much in therapy. It, it wasn't addressed how neurotic I was over, uh, over the subjects I was spinning about. And uh, it took a lot of time and it took a lot of learning for me to be able to embrace what I needed in new thinking patterns and emotions. The second time that I was told uh, to work through, uh, to consider medication, interestingly enough, was not too long ago. It was just a few years ago. I was working through some aspects of depression and was brought to my realization that a lot of my intense ministry work, church consulting, working through helping ministers and working in church crisis, working in that, and, and even my own journey of interaction with ministries had created a lot of collateral damage and sometimes direct explosion in my life. And I didn't realize it was a form of what I would call ministry PTSD. And so I was navigating and working through that. But in, in, in working in a one-on-one setting in therapy, I was told early, not, not, not too far into it, hey, you may want to consider medication. And I'll be honest, I was a bit disappointed that he jumped that quickly into it because I was there rolling up my sleeves going, I'm willing to, willing to do the work. I'm not taken back by uh, areas that are a struggle. I'll do what it takes. It'll take as long as it takes. And so it, there is a concern many times how quickly a subject of medication is brought into the picture. I'll get into that some more um, in this broadcast. But I, I was there going, I'm looking for tools and feel free to speak into distortions you see because I want to learn and I want to grow. So those are brief snapshots of my experience uh, with medication, I'll get some more into what I've learned and what I think is important. Now, many of you want to just know up front, how does Mark feel about medication? I'm going to tell you up front. I'll give you your upfront answer so then we can get into the discussion. I'm not 100% for medication, and I'm not 100% against it. Is it okay for me to live in that dimension? Is it possible for you to live in that arena? We live in a world that pushes very black and white perspectives on a lot of things pushes people into extreme labels. And that bugs me. It bothers me. I see it in the church. I see it in society. I see it in politics. And for example, if you have concerns, you are often labeled anti. So if you have concerns with pharmaceutical drugs, then you're anti-pharma. If you have concerns about vaccination, which can even become a swear word in social media, if you have concerns about vaccination, then you are labeled anti-vax. This is troublesome because it doesn't give nuance for us to discuss issues and to work through the problems and to actually work towards improvement. Very, very concerning that we see in, so in society. This kind of ditches that people get pushed into doesn't allow us to find helpful answers and perspectives. It just produces strife. And to be honest, the devil loves that because he's the one authoring the strife and keeping these battles going and preventing people from simply getting educated and learning. I'll tell you, there are often two roads of thought when it comes to medicine. One is the mainstream medicine, which is often driven by pharmaceuticals and vaccinations. And then there's the natural medicine that we could call, uh, there's a couple different names for it, functional medicine, integrative medicine. I have frustrations in both arenas. Mainstream medicine often just throws medication at everything. Quick test doesn't go deeper. Meanwhile, functional or integrative medicine can cost you a fortune and exhaust you and you still be where you are. So it's led me back to realizing at the end of the day, this is a journey and one step at a time. I've got to learn. I've got to advocate for myself. I've got to, I've got to figure out what's going to help me the best. So, but I want you to know this up front. And if you're, if you're into learning and nuance and, and, and seeing uh, the different perspectives that are important for you and keep listening, keep watching. If you want to shove me into a ditch and just put there, I'm not into being in ditches. I'm into driving on the road. Uh, I'll read you a quote by Peter Levine, who has some great, great content regarding trauma. I'll be teaching uh, more and more on the subject of trauma and 
in years ahead. He says this, and I agree. While medication can at times be quite helpful, they are of themselves insufficient. So it's just important to keep in mind. There's so many directions I could go on this subject as I was writing and writing. My work in this over the months and years, some of it's, I'm, I had to remind myself, I'm not writing a book on this, and uh, this, isn't, this isn't a thesis. And I didn't want to get too heady into this. I didn't want to get where you get overwhelmed with technicalities. And that's what happens with subjects like this. We get so much in the technicalities that we don't understand the simple things. So what I'd like to do is just get into a brief history of of medication, especially in mental health. I'm going to kind of keep it narrowed to that, although I could go into other pharmaceutical drug areas as well too. If you look at substances, you look at what we get into the development of uh, of chemicals that are utilized for pharmaceutical drugs that help your emotional mental state. We could, we'll look way back in history. We'd look back at alcohol because alcohol was often used and it has gone back since ancient days as a way to alleviate anxiety or to escape pain. Using the opium plant, and there's research that says that goes way back thousands of years. History also shows that psychoactive mushrooms were utilized where someone could alter their mental state. Those have been around for a long time. Now, a hundred years ago, the idea of taking medicine for struggles of the mind and emotions was not a mainstream perspective. You may see some of it there historically, even though you may see something like drugs of morphine going back to the early 1800s. And barbiturates came about in around the mid-1800s. But the proliferation of psychiatric medication really took off about 50 to 70 years ago. We're going back to post-World War II and the 1950s. In fact, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff goes back to post-World War II, which is one of the reasons that, um, that I often am fascinated by World War II because there's a lot of things that took place and shifted from that time. Now, most people think that psychiatric medication started with doctors, scientists, and researchers looking for medicinal ways to help battles with like schizophrenia or melancholia, which is now called depression or anxiety. But this isn't true. This isn't how it started. Interestingly enough, drugs that are being researched for one problem often have certain unexpected effects that are then considered for use in another way. And this is how mental health medication was actually birthed, is let's research this. We see this symptom coming up out of the drug. Maybe we could use it over here. If you want to learn more about that, go look up how Viagra was discovered. (laughs) And that'll be an interesting learning journey. So if we go back to the 1950s, one of these drug accident discoveries involved a drug named chlorpromazine. You'll have to forgive me. I'm not, I won't pronounce everything just right. I get a little bit tongue tied. Or it can also be known as Thorazine. And uh, this is linked. If you look at mental health medication, a lot of the history goes back to usage of it for schizophrenia. And, and this, this was first looked at. This drug was first looked at as a possible antihistamine. When you look at mental health and the history of medication, a lot of it goes back to antihistamines, which, which is utilized for allergies. When you have an allergic reaction, your body produces histamines, which creates these uh, manifestations that we have, redness of skin, itching, coughing, so forth. And antihistamine will push back. Uh, so you see like Benadryl and stuff like that that we see in modern use. Okay, well, way back in the 50s, This drug chlorpromazine was looked at as a possible antihistamine, but when it was tested, it produced produced a sedative effect. This drug was combined with anesthesia. Okay, you understand what anesthesia is, right? It would be combined with anesthesia to allow patients to go into somewhat of a hibernation state during surgery so that they wouldn't go into shock when they're being opened up. But what they saw is that it would make patients manifest a very calm, but yet, here's the wording they use, a very disinterested state of mind. So they said, hmm, with this observation, they convinced psychiatrists in the military to use it on patients who had psychosis. So one 
one patient in particular that they that they report says that patient was able to leave the hospital and resume a normal life. And so that key person was utilized to further look at more of this. Okay? So an example like this opened the door for more and more searching for chemical compounds that would help mental disorders. And if you if you want to search the history of antidepressants, Again, we're going to go back to post-World War II. Doctors at this time were looking for treatments for tuberculosis. They were experiencing with a drug, with, with a chemical rather, called hydrazine. Okay? Do you know what hydrazine is? It's rocket fuel. Yes, it's rocket fuel. And this was in abundance after World War II. We're not in need as much anymore of rocket fuel. And so companies wanted to know how to make money with, with, with this abundance of hydrazine by seeking to use it for other purposes. And if you read the story of pharmaceutical drugs, you will also find there's a lot of history, a lot of reading of searching of how to use oil, petroleum, other chemicals to be used for other purposes, including medication. So in the 1950s, they were working with this hydrazine and they used a modified version of it on tuberculosis patients. And they noticed an interesting side effect. The mood of many of the patients was heightened. There's even reports of patients dancing in the hallway. (laughs) There was a euphoric effect that the drug had on them. This was not what they were looking for, but a psychiatrist noticed this, observed it, and decided to test it to help depressed patients. Researchers claimed, this is what they claim, that it inhibited an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. Okay, I mean, I'm pronouncing that exactly right, but you'll notice uh, monoamine, monoamine oxidase, or MAO, otherwise known as MAOIs. Okay. So companies, you may have heard of that. You may have heard that even in drug disclosures. If you're on MAOIs, you know, you see in the the long list when pharmaceutical companies do their advertising. So, okay, getting back to this trail, companies continue to follow this trail now, seeing, okay, there might be something to this. There might be a way for us to um, be able to find more, more drugs here. So they are seeing if there's any more modifications that can be made, again, to these antihistamine-like compounds for helping mood issues like depression. So this brought about the, the um, development of what are called tricyclic antidepressants. You might see it as TCA. The first one was called imipramine. And around this time, the theory, this is where the theory of serotonin and serotonin levels being helped in the brain, this was floated around, which... This is where it's very challenging because it's hard to find the actual research evidence and the actual data that supports this and the methodologies of what are they measuring, okay? So one key thing that was used to support this uh, theory is um, in the 60s, researchers claimed that they found evidence that corpses, okay, as they were examining corpses of people who died from suicide, They say they have found they had low serotonin levels. Now, I can't figure out, was was there nuance to this? Was there multifaceted questions being asked in this? Was it because those who committed suicide had intense stress levels uh, at the moment of it? Uh, What were stress levels like in their lives? How were they even measuring this? Okay, this is this is a foundational story in the history of what is called the chemical imbalance. But there's so many questions and so many aspects of this that make it difficult to find helpful answers of this led to this led to this led to this. Okay, I'm trying to bring some organization to this. So the serotonin thing is brought up. There was also a a theory brought forth of dopamine and the influence of dopamine, especially with schizophrenia. That's a whole trail you can look on your own if you're nerdy and want to, want to get into that. But I'll kind of stick with this concept as the serotonin thing is very important because this fascination led into drugs that were called and are called SSRIs, serotonin selective 
reuptake inhibitors. This is fancy wording for simply saying, and this is the, the concept, that in the synapse and these neurological connections in your brain, there's a firing that goes from one end, it hits another receptor, it's then sent back. That's a reuptake. And so as they're looking at neurotransmitters, they're floating around this theory that says there is a problem in the synapse. And so if we block the reuptake, so transmits serotonin and the reuptake being sent out, if we block the, the reuptake, the serotonin will float in the synapse and possibly float longer, therefore helping your serotonin levels. Well, this is very, very challenging to look at, and I'm looking at the data, looking at the data, because from what I see, you can look at serotonin in the blood, but you can't measure serotonin in the brain. There isn't a meter that goes, okay, let's do this test. We got this much serotonin going on. We need to change and shift that. Nonetheless, this has become not only a driving force in pharmaceutical psychiatric medicine, it has become a commonplace usage in promotion, in advertising, in medicine in general. So going back to history, pharmaceutical companies with this now uh, being promoted, they went into a rush of producing what's called antidepressant drugs, which many of them are SSRIs. And the first one being Prozac, fluoxetine, developed at Eli Lilly in the early 1970s. But it wasn't used in prescription until the late 80s, specifically 1988. During this time period, the pharmaceutical companies began to really utilize. And if you go back and you could even search in Google, you can look and search and find all kinds of advertisements and what they use. And boy, there are some really silly, deceptive, sometimes crazy things that are used in advertisement. I wonder what we will do 30, 40 years from now, looking back at advertisements that are given today. And so this then promoted this mindset of the chemical imbalance. At the time, psychiatrists as a whole were resistant to this because we were, we were going through a lot, psychiatry was going through a lot of changes in mental institutions, for example, where uh, historically when somebody had a mental health problem, the family just hunkered down and helped. But then there were a lot of abuses. People were being left in barns. They were left in filth. And many families were just kind of gave up on helping those in the family. So then became uh, this, this development of mental institutions or asylums. And there were many breakthroughs in that of working with people and helping them to get bathed and have routines and to have loving interaction and learning to work on their relationship skills. And sometimes getting them out of family could help because it got them out of the familiar and caused them to work. Then there were work on themselves. Then there were abuses over time where then people were treated poorly in asylums. And um, so this then made way for new approaches to go, how do, we, how do we do this? And this is what brought forth um, the collision where psychiatrists at first were going, we're resistant to this, just giving people medication. But then over time, there became an interweaving of medicine to business. Now we have the development of pharmaceutical companies. Then we have the federal government, which comes in, the FDA. And now the government is relating to pharmaceutical industries, which now brings about lobbyists who lobbyists are very, very powerful influences, right? So it developed this relationship then with the psychology and psychiatric community now and this whole web that could have some great things to help people, but it also has a lot of problems to it. Now, one book that I would encourage you to read if you're passionate about this subject for your life and your journey. I, I don't necessarily 
uh, advocate for every application that that he may necessarily promote. Uh, I could get into that in another time, but uh, I really appreciate the book material that um, is in The Body Keeps the Score, a book written by Basil van der Kolk, who is respected far and wide because of his involvement, his experience, and his his insight of what he saw during the days of these transitions of what was going on in mental health and how mental health was being approached. He's an expert in the field of trauma, and I appreciate how he writes about working through human suffering and developing relational aspects of healing, working through how your body responds to tragic events, getting in touch with your emotions in a healthy way, even learning to physically connect through touch and some of the important things of that. And he shares many of the mentoring insights that he received. I don't think I, no, I don't have that. I don't have it in the slide. So allow me to uh, take some time to read to you some excerpts from his book, The Body Keeps the Score, that I think would be really helpful for us to understand in how things began to change. Let me first begin with some things that his mentors spoke. One of his teachers, he says, taught us that most human suffering is related to love and loss, and that the job of therapists is to help people acknowledge, experience, and bear the reality of life with all its pleasures and heartbreak. The greatest source of our suffering are the lies we tell ourselves. He'd say, urging, urging us to be honest. He's speaking of a mentor that's, that's instructing them. Urging us to be honest with ourselves about every facet of our experience. He often said that people can never get better without knowing what they know and feeling what they feel. So you see here the, the, the experiential relational journey of working through trauma, working on your mental health. I appreciate this so much. He said, this was an interesting little excerpt. I remember being surprised to hear this distinguished old Harvard professor confess how comforted he was to feel his wife's bum against him as he fell asleep at night. An interesting picture, right? Of just connection, of just touch, of the importance and how he treasured that. By disclosing such simple human needs in himself, he helped us recognize how basic they were to our lives. Failure to attend to them results in a stunted existence, no matter how lofty our thoughts and worldly accomplishments. It shows us how important simple things are to mental health. That's why I believe all mental health healing and recovery is about going back to fundamentals. And I appreciate his expression of simple things like touch, hugs, words, bonding, healthy, relational, renewed experience. He said, he, again, talking about his mentors, uh, Van der Kolk here saying, healing, he told us, depends on experiential knowledge, in me- meaning it's not just getting something in your head, it's experiencing it in your life. You can be fully in charge of your life if you can acknowledge the reality of your body in all its visceral dimensions. And it's interesting how he speaks in trauma, people who've experienced trauma, and even people who've just battling mental health issues in general can feel disconnected from their bodies, oftentimes because we're disconnected from ourselves. And so, but he shares here, this is where he he shares the shift that took place in psychological, psychiatric work. He says, our profession, however, was moving in a different direction. In 1968, the American Journal of Psychiatry had published the results of the study from a ward where I had been an attendant. They showed unequivocally that schizophrenic patients who received drugs alone had a better outcome than those who talked three times a week with the best therapists in Boston. This study was one of many milestones on a road that gradually changed how medicine and psychiatry approached psychological problems. From infinitely variable expressions of intolerable feelings and relationships to a brain disease model of discrete disorders, put in quotes. The way medicine approaches human suffering has always been determined by the technology available at any given time. Before the Enlightenment, aberrations and behavior were ascribed to God, sin, magic, witches, and evil spirits. It was only in the 19th century that scientists in France 
and Germany began to investigate behavior as an, adapta- as an adaptation to the complexities of the world. Now, a new paradigm was emerging. Anger, lust, pride, greed, aver- avarice, avarice, sorry, and sloth, as well as all the other problems we humans have always struggled to manage, were recast as disorders that could be fixed by the administration of appropriate chemicals. Allow me to read that again. Now a new paradigm was emerging. All these emotions, anger, lust, pride, greed, avarice, and sloth, as well as all the problems, these are now disorders that could be fixed with chemicals. This is one of the concerns of the modern movement of how, how medication and chemicals and how we relate to them. Back to the book. Many psychiatrists were relieved and delighted to now become, he says, quote, real scientists, just like their med school classmates who had laboratories, animal experiences, expensive equipment, complicated diagnostic tests, and set aside the woolly-headed theories of philosophers like Freud and Jung. A major textbook of psychiatry went so far as to state the cause of mental illness is now considered an aberration of the brain, a chemical imbalance. Like my colleagues, I eagerly embraced the pharmacological revolution. In 1973, I became the first chief resident in psychopharmacology at MMHC. I also, I may also have been the first psychiatric, uh, I'm sorry, first psychiatrist in Boston to administer lithium to a manic depressive patient. That's another aspect of uh, psychiatric meds that you can look at is the history of lithium. On lithium, a woman who had been who had been manic every uh, it was every every May or every day, I think it's every every, every day. I, mess, I might have a mistype here. For the past thirty five years, and suicidally depressed. No, I think it is May who had been manic every <laughs> who had been manic every May for the past thirty five years, and suicidally depressed every November. Stopped cycling and remained stable for the three years she was under my care. I was also part of the first U.S. research team to test the antipsychotic uh, clozaril on chronic patients who were warehoused in the back wards of the old insane asylums. Some of their responses were miraculous. People who had spent much of their lives locked in their own separate, terrifying realities were now able to return to their families and communities. Patients mired in darkness and despair started to respond to the beauty of human contact and the pleasure of work and play. These amazing results made us optimistic that we could finally conquer human misery. Now, I'm going to read further. And I know this is, there's, there's a lot here I'm quoting and, and, and taking from the book. But I, I want to utilize this to help you to see big picture here. He continues, It did not take long for pharmacology to revolutionize psychiatry. Drugs gave doctors a greater sense of efficacy and provided a tool beyond talk therapy. Drugs also produced income and profits. Grants from the pharmaceutical industry provided us with laboratories filled with energetic graduate students and sophisticated instruments. Psychiatry departments, which had always been located in the basement of hospitals, started to move up, both in terms of location and prestige. Listen to this. One symbol of this change occurred at MMHC, where in the early 1990s, the hospital's swimming pool was paved over to make space for a laboratory, and the indoor basketball court was carved up into cubicles for the new medication clinic. This is, this is amazing when I read this. For decades, doctors and patients had democratically shared the pleasures of splashing in the pool and passing balls down the court. Could you imagine this? Doctors just hanging out with patients and hanging out in the pool and playing basketball. Fascinating. He says, I spent hours in the gym with patients back when I was a ward attendant. It was the one place. Sometimes I want to cry reading this because you see the relational connection here. It was the one place where we all could restore a sense of physical well-being. An island in the midst of misery we face every day. And now it had become a place for patients to get fixed. The drug revolution that started out with so much promise 
may in the end have done as much harm as good. The theory that mental illness is caused primarily by chemical imbalances in the brain that can be corrected by specific drugs has become broadly accepted by the media and the public as well as the medical profession. In many places, drugs have displaced therapy and enabled patients to suppress their emotions without addressing the underlying issues. Can't help but read that again. In many places, drugs have displaced therapy and enabled, pre- and enabled patients to suppress their problems without addressing the underlying issues. Antidepressants can make all the difference in the world in helping with day-to-day functioning. And if it comes to a choice between taking a sleeping pill and drinking yourself into a stupor every night to get a few hours sleep, there's no question which is preferable. For people who are exhausted from trying to make it on their own through yoga classes, work, workout routines, or simply toughing it out, medication, medications often can bring life-saving relief. The SSRIs can be helpful in making traumatized people less enslaved by their emotions, but they should only be considered adjuncts in their overall treatment. So I, I pray that that was helpful. The, and this, this is somebody who is in the trenches. And in the trenches of change going on. So I appreciate the observations and understanding how medication has come into culture and in some areas taken over a bit. So I want to give you just some sober observations on understanding mental health. And that's really my goal in this. Compassionate grace and sobriety. Reasonably coming to understanding of perspectives to help you in the long haul. The first thing that I want to share is that we live in a culture that views pharmaceutical medication as a often a primary, main, and quite often an only way of treating people. Not all, but a lot. This has really consumed our culture. For example, if you hear this sentence, depression is treatable. I'm sure many of you have heard that. They do not mean it's treatable with exercise, diet modifications, getting counseling, therapy, working on your nutrition, reparenting, working through trauma, facing how hard you are on yourself, learning to be loved and love others. No, they mean by medication. However you feel about psychiatric medication, it has become obvious to me that people think quickly of medication to serve their mental health. Just like we've been conditioned to first look to medication to solve our other health issues, rather than focusing on the many ways we can actually add to, increase, and empower our overall health. We live in a culture today where doctor's visits are streamlined for quick visits and for efficiency. Typically, a 15-minute visit, many times even shorter. And this is very problematic when it comes to mental health because the way you think, feel, and experience life is very multifaceted. Your health history has layers to it. With a quick visit culture, there's no time to get to know your world. Very few are asked, so when did this start? Are you, are you in connection with your experiences and how you feel about yourself? What do you got going on in your life? They might say it quickly, get rid of stress and be easy on yourself, on your way. But they don't have time for that. And honestly, many patients that come in, they don't have time to be asked those questions. We want a quick fix so we can go back to our same lifestyle. And so the the same thing is true for many ailments in life. I don't want to modify my eating patterns. Just give me something that will make, uh, give me a change here so I can just go on with life. I heard a respected PhD psychologist that I interacted with say this. He said, many people do not want to take a pill, but we often want a pill-like solution for our mental health. Now, I also want to, con- I also want to confront a common saying that goes like this. The saying says, if you have a, a physical health issue, then you go to a doctor and you take medication. So why do we hesitate with a mental health issue taking medication to help us? I'm not in alignment with that statement for a lot of reasons. First of all, if you have a physical issue, I don't necessarily advocate that you jump to medication. Okay, as as a start. Secondly, 
we're creating this equivalent that a mental health battle is the same as someone who needs diabetes medication. It's not an equal comparison, but it's used all the time to promote psychiatric medication. So number two is uh, pharmaceutical companies influence and drive a lot of our modern medicine. You have to remember, pharmacology is a business, a big business. And I'm going to tell you quite honestly, take if this broadcast is, is a blessing to you, please share it. Because the algorithm may not be friendly to me in the words I'm saying or the viewpoints that I'm expressing here. But pharmacology is a big, 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 giant business, super big business. That's why it is often called Big Pharma, because it has a lot of power. Now, when you go to your typical doctor, in modern medicine, you are often dealing with a pharmacological agent that is looking for a diagnosis. Here's your drug. Modern medical treatment has become more about pharmacology. If you turn on your TV and watch the commercials, TV shows, and especially the news, watch your evening news if you still use that to to get your news. All the commercials are sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. So the news corporations are not going to confront problems straight on. Those pharmaceutical companies pay their bills. So don't look to television news to address it in an unbiased way or really address anything in an unbiased way. That's a whole subject on its own. But pharmaceuticals and and vax companies have major power and major influence in government policies over elected officials and the mental health arena from those high up influencing all the way down, especially because of money, financial contributions and lobbyists And trust me, the more you research on this, the more agonizing it could be of how we've gotten here. Commercials are everywhere. And in support of pharmaceuticals. And doctors' offices are, you have to realize, they're first and foremost, they're businesses. Pharma is business. They're looking for profits. Now, there was a time where doctors used to be more in charge. And pharmaceutical companies and, by the way, insurance companies are now in charge. It is what it is. I'll also say this too. In modern technology, you can go online and you can review a doctor. So if you don't like your visit, you go and you can post two-star review, one-star review. Oh, this doctor is terrible, right? Doctors are aware of that. They need to have a successful financial business. So... Even if you need to be told the truth and spoken straight to, they may not. If you're not shown that you are someone who can be given instruction, they wouldn't want to necessarily hurt their reviews. And so many times, it's not just blaming doctors, blaming pharma. It's also recognizing as a culture, we don't want to change our lifestyle. We don't want to change our diet. We don't want to exercise. We don't want to work through pain. We don't want to be uncomfortable for long periods of time working through things. It's just where we're at. We like to point fingers in all this. And I say, instead of pointing fingers, let's be sober and look at where we're at. And now each of us take personal responsibility to go, I need to be willing to do the work for my life and for my journey. Now, many people don't understand this and I have to bring it to their attention. Medication addresses symptoms. Pharmaceutical drugs do not address root causes. I even know people who are in the pharmaceutical industry, even down to the labs. And when I would say this, they nod their heads and go, yeah, this is, we're, we're seeing a symptom of something that is a, considered a syndrome, a disorder, or a, an actual disease. And we're trying to deal with the symptoms and the drug addresses the symptoms. It's not getting to the root cause. You have to understand that. In fact, when you read the the DSM manual, which that's not necessarily casual reading, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of uh, Psychiatric you know, Battlegrounds and Mental Health Issues, when they're, when they're bringing out a mental health battle, the uh, big message is we don't know what causes this. We don't know the root struggle. Here's some symptoms. Here we know some things that help. 
Now, what often gets shoved to is there's a chemical imbalance, which then now brings in the pharmaceutical companies. Okay. Here's something I hope will help you. Sometimes people, not sometimes, a lot of times when people think of medication, they see it as I got something wrong in the brain. Medication is going to go into my body and it's going to fulfill something my body is missing. It's kind of like when you work on a puzzle and you get that one piece that's missing, right? And you're like looking everywhere under the desk. You're looking around. Where's that piece, right? And then when you get that piece in, ah, there's this satisfaction. The picture's complete. Many people with this chemical imbalance kind of mindset, I go, well, I've got this one area that needs tweaking. This chemical is going to fix that now. No, that's not what's happening. You're introducing a foreign substance into your body a foreign chemical. When it hits your body, your body reacts to it and now has to work to adjust to it. It's helping. It may be helping some symptoms, but you're also going to have to deal with side effects and you're also going to have to deal with what does it look like for the body to long-term be on this outside chemical that I'm taking in. Okay. More on that in just a few. This is, if I was to talk about medicine, I cannot talk about medicine without talking about the placebo effect. This, to me, is one of the most fascinating things in the discovery of medication. Placebo effect is more powerful than many, many people realize. And Christians, you need to understand this because it actually taps in to understanding how faith works. What is the placebo effect? It's basically when it appears that a person's physical or mental health is improving after taking medication when you didn't actually take any medication at all. And so it's basically you were given a pill, but there was nothing in it, but you start to feel better symptomatically. There is a psychological, and I would say even spiritual component that takes place when we're taking of something that whether you say spiritually or subconsciously, however you want to say it, there's an element of belief or faith and trusting in it and going, something's going to happen. This placebo is so big of a deal that it has been put into drug testing. Now, don't get me started with drug testing and and things like that. But there is this process when a drug is tested that they're to go through what is called a double-blind placebo. Now, what does that mean? Let me just break this down. It means that you have a group of participants. Some of them are getting the drug. Some of them are not. And you may get, you may, uh, those who are not, you may get like a nothing pill. A double blind placebo means that no, no person in the room taking of the drug in the study knows what they're taking, if they're taking the drug or not. And the people administering it don't know. This is double blind. Both people are blind to whether or not the placebo effect is there. And they need to implement this because the placebo is a such a high percentage influence in people's symptoms being alleviated. This is incredible. It shows us the power of belief and putting belief into action. That actually shows the power of faith. Now, I'm not promoting a kind of claim it kind of stuff. I'm going to claim that this, or I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. The placebo effect really just happens with you just, you just release yourself into it. I take it. And I just, I hope and believe it's going to help. It's more like that than like pumping yourself up and shouting. And I'm declaring over this, that as I take it, God, you're going to, you know, people, Christians get a lot of, you get very superstitious. It's more out of just it's more out of releasing yourself into the process. Like how many of you, you see things change happen in your life when you just learn to kind of just like, like let go and trust the journey and process? It, it, that, that belief and faith can have a powerful, powerful work. So I'll mention this more again a little bit later. And again, I'm doing, I'm doing a, a deeper, deeper, because when I talk about these subjects, I got to take my time. So understand that. Now, here we go. One of the common causes given to mental health is a chemical imbalance construct. And I'm going to use that word very intentionally construct. And I will explain what I mean by that. This is a tough one. This is the toughest part of this talk. 
because the concept chemical imbalance is so ingrained in modern culture. And when, when something is ingrained in modern culture, it's hard to talk through it, to bring it up. It, no matter how many lies, distortions, and misrepresentation are in existence, it's hard to cut through because people have very, very strong perceptions motivated by many misrepresentations, distortions, or even straight up lies. We've been programmed, folks, to believe this concept and then now just take the next steps. It's been woven into psychology, psychiatry, everyday advertising. Most of society has been conditioned to think mental health battles means something in your brain's chemistry is off and you need a medication that's going to tweak that chemistry that's off in your brain. Now, more and more is coming out, whether it's research, whether it's more in-depth investigation, I don't know why it's taking this long, is actually confronting and confirming that the theory of a chemical imbalance is just that, a theory. In fact, it's actually a construct. What do I mean by construct? It's a man-made idea without clear research and data to show the specifics that this theory is true. Really, a lot of science is formed by a theory that's developed, testing that's done. The testing must be challenged. It must be questioned, must be looked at. And folks, we live in a society where that is gone. The ability to question, to challenge, because that is what helps science get more firm in its rooting and get more firm in what observations and results can benefit. The chemical imbalance, I feel myself on a daily basis, like I'm, I'm walking through a swamp as I'm trying to help people because it owns the narrative. Because people say, Mark, do you think I just have a chemical issue? And they ask their friends, do you think I just have a chemical issue? And then your friend goes, yeah, I think I do. Okay, and you're going <laughs> to... We've been trained and conditioned to believe that there's these chemicals in our brain that are off. And I take this, the pill goes in and it starts, it starts adjusting and tweaking those levels. Like, like we're dealing with levers on a soundboard. We're just going to turn up the volume here. We're going to turn down the volume here. And it's dangerously simplistic and it's actually not accurate. Now, this is how it often shows up to me. Someone's frantically contacting me in a state of emergency, a crisis-driven manifestation. Mark, I'm really in a bad place. I don't know what to do. I need help now. Do I just need medication? I just need medication, right? And this happens quite often. They believe my brain is broken and I need a chemical fix to help the chemicals that are off in my brain. It's almost like uh, I have a, a pot, a recipe, and I'm missing salt, so I just got to add some salt and get this recipe. Ah, now it's fixed. And it's challenging because with every mental health battleground, every mental health battleground, I'm going to be very cautious about how many every and all I use in this broadcast. With every mental health battleground, a person needs to slow down and realize I've got some learning. I've got to get some help. I've got to now walk a new journey that may involve, most likely, a renovation of learning and relearning. But many people don't want the renovation. They're stuck in emergency quick fix mode. And so they want a quick fix. They want, and so the chemical imbalance construct gives room for that. Hey, do this, you'll be all right. You know, you just, you know. We don't give room for what we really need. And what society has always struggled with since the dawn of creation, especially since the work of sin in the land, which has produced breakdown in relationships, is we've struggled in dealing with our emotions. And it goes back to childhood. It goes back to our family system. It goes back to our life experiences. We are not emotionally equipped. And let me speak to the church, the body of Christ. We have had a need to become more emotionally developed forever. I'm going to go back thousands of years. God is calling us to walk in emotional maturity. The, uh, Paul in his writings calls, talks about the full stature of who we are. 
But you don't mature unless you understand how to work through healing of the heart and working through emotional teaching and training. Many people think maturity is just not showing emotions and being emotionless and just kind of numb and people who don't react emotionally, they're mature. Really, maturity involves people that know how to navigate emotions effectively and through time and experience, they develop wisdom to help others. Folks, we lack this. And we have to come to sober realizations that the chemical imbalance theory in many ways feeds our desire for just a quick answer. When you have a mental health battleground, it's really an invitation for you to work through how you think, how you feel. And really, I got to be honest, mental health is really emotional work. It's working through your emotions. And how many of you have actually had training in that? When it's what you do all day long, all the time. What you do in life is influenced by your emotions, how you interpret and how you relate to them. Mental health is really about emotional help. And in order to do that, I got I to gotta work through distortions I carry. I may have to see a therapist and, and that therapist and I don't click. And I have to go to a different one and find someone where, where it's helpful. And it, it's, it's over time, I, I work through it. I have to acknowledge brokenness in my life. I've got to learn. Uh, I've got distortions. I got to let a journey. I got to let a process happen. I got to work through trauma and drama and relationship stuff. But if we don't embrace a journey, we're going to get sucked into this. And sadly, the chemical imbalance mindset has been a strong concept that pharmaceutical companies have latched onto. It's been the greatest marketing tool of all time. I'll talk about. SSRIs for just a moment. Serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. I explained what they do. Most people believe that serotonin is the main issue. We got to fix serotonin. Your serotonin levels are off and this drug will improve your serotonin levels. And it's just not that simple. The theory is that these drugs block the reuptake of serotonin in the synapse to keep it floating and therefore give you overall improvement. The truth is they really don't know exactly what these medications are doing to the body and to the brain. You cannot test serotonin levels in the brain and then just go tweak them. Long-term testing still needs to be done on the lifelong impact of these meds, especially because they were not meant for the long-term use that people are now uh, plugged into. We have people that are now going on decades of using these. Most of what SSRIs do is, and you can even see this in, in, in terminology, is an emotional blunting that takes place. It blunts the effect of depressive emotions, blunts the effect of maybe anxiety, panic. Okay? Now, I, 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 heard, one, um, I heard one doctor say that in research, one thing they have found is there may be an anti-inflammatory aspect to what SSRIs are doing in the body which is interesting because inflammation is a problem today in, in mental health, in all kinds of diseases. Inflammation is your body's response to something that shouldn't be happening, shouldn't be there. It's reacting. So it usually reacting to a toxin. Now, there's many different types of toxins. There's environmental toxins like mold. Mold's a big one. If you've had exposure to mold, you need to do a lot of uh, work and research and understanding on protocols. I've been very negatively affected by mold and am still to this day uh, working through avenues of health that, that I know were affected by being exposed to mold. Uh, we can talk about pesticides, uh, sprays, uh, even foods that have toxins, um, processed ingredients, and you can get into GMOs. Okay, that's one, but there's another kind of toxin too that we don't talk about. Chronic stress, poor relationships, abuse, lack of sleep, bad eating habits, living with self-hatred. That's emotional toxicity. So there could be an aspect of inflammatory reactions going on that's affecting mood, that's affecting overall health. So the SSRIs are, are producing a blunting. If, if that, now many take them, you, how many of you know somebody who's depressed who has an SSRI? They're still depressed, right? And, um, and, 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 and many go, yeah, I'm not seeing much effects. Studies have, have shown that exercise 
is proven better than antidepressants, but that doesn't make any money. But it's the better way, and it costs you nothing. <laughs> Just emotional work to get moving. And there's also, you can get into a lot of other ones. I'm going to keep this focused, okay? Because this could have turned into a whole thesis <laughs> that could have, I could have put together. Because there's also SNRI, serotonin, and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Kind of the same concept. But I'd like to take a, a few moments and focus in on one that's very concerning. That's benzodiazepines. This is a class of, of drugs that I need to mention need to talk about, otherwise known as benzos or in the old days they're called downers. These drugs produce sedation and a, a form of hypnosis. They were developed going back to the 50s to relieve anxiety, severe panic attacks, muscle spasms, and reduce seizures. Many common names that you would be familiar with are Valium, Xanax, Ativan, and Clonopin. Xanax in particular has become a, a cultural term, right? You hear people say on TV or in the movies, I need a Xanax, you know? I mentioned this class of drugs for a lot of reasons because as soon as I began many, many, many moons ago, when I began to focus in on helping people in their healing and freedom journey and, and mental health, I ran into the, reper the, the, the repercussions of benzo overuse, long-term benzo use, benzo withdrawal issues, I'm super concerned about the medication, this specific medication. And I've, ran into, I've run into so many people who using this drug, they've had a lot of negative effects and then even trying to come off of them for many has been an absolute nightmare. You can actually find many support groups and websites and uh, people talking about this. It's been more underground. So many people feel lonely in this battle. They feel crazy because they, they're, they're having all these side effects or having withdrawal symptoms or whatever. And um, something's wrong with me. They, they, it causes them to go into further spinning and further despair. Benzodiazepines have become the modern emotional painkiller. Now, I'm not saying these drugs are the same, but, but mindset-wise, we have a similar relationship to them like we do with opioids being brought about as a physical painkiller. And I believe we're going to see, just as we've seen more and more about opioids, we're going to see more and more about the long-term impact benzos has been having on people. There's even been some research that's coming out about the effect of long-term benzodiazepine use and, and the effect of potential Alzheimer's. That's just one aspect. But um, basically, the biggest effect that benzos had, like I said, it's a sedation kind of impact or hypnotic kind of effect. Benzos are only meant to be used short term, two, maybe four weeks. I, I, I'm concerned first and foremost about how we are treating emotions and blunting them away and sedating people away. Do we ever actually get to the emotions and learn to handle them in an effective way by just not feeling them anymore? Are we, still, are we still being impacted by the torment, but now we're disconnected to it. We're numb to it. So you have anxiousness, you have, you have um, sadness, depression, you have guilt, you have shame. Are they gone because you, you're numb to it? But are we still tormented, but now beyond outside our ability to actually connect to them and work through them? I think modern culture is seeing benzos as a stress relief, like I need a Xanax, kind of like somebody would say, I need a drink. Now, post 9-11, benzodiazepine use increased. COVID benzodiazepine use has increased. We're seeing at mass scale, people are struggling in a very, very personal way with, with anxiety that stems back to trauma that hasn't been worked through. Stem back to how they've been taught about God, how, they taught, how they're taught about themselves, how they're taught about life. And I'm super concerned culturally at how we're looking to a pill to rescue us from ourselves. And I believe God's work is actually restoring you from being disconnected to yourself. I don't condemn anyone who's been on them. Remember at the beginning of this broadcast, I told you 
I took them from time to time. So this is this is knowledge and understanding. Uh, and and it's very very clear. These are meant to be used super short term to maybe stabilize somebody. And I'm just seeing more and more people using them long term basis, and then kind of scratching their head, going, "What's wrong with me?" In many of the things that they're struggling of the side effects that they're having. Okay, I, I got to say up front. I'll get to this in just a moment. Do not just go. Okay, I'm dropping these today because that can be a very dangerous step as well. Too, you're going to need help in learning how to taper. Okay, I'll get back to this some more. I could talk about uh, antipsychotics. Again, that's a whole issue in itself. I, I, I'm giving I'm giving some areas to touch on that I think are important to recognize. But I do find that people can be on multiple of these at once. Uh, many write to me on two or three medications. All right. Now, when we talk about, <clears throat> let me change my slide deck over here. Mental health issues like depression, they have so many multifaceted aspects that influence it. To communicate, oh, your brain is just broken and needs a chemical fix, it's, it's a very oversimplistic and can even be a deceptive perspective as it's teaching people very shallow perspectives about their mental health journey. The truth is the chemical imbalance has been a term that pharmaceutical drugs use to market their products. Now listen, every Every business, they market, and when they market and they advertise, there can be forms of exaggeration that are in there. I just think it's very, very problematic when we're dealing with stuff like this. Um, Pharmaceutical companies, they do studies and publish results that make their products look good and effective. They selectively publish their research. They don't share the data that that they're looking. A lot of, in research, those things are, are often hidden. So. Other people need to be able to look at the data and go, I want to see how you came to that conclusion. So what they often do is have these research things that they'll present, and then there's peer reviews that are reviewing the the, the results that they're expressing, but the reviews are not actually going back to the original data. So if you do an experiment and you say, here's the conclusion I came to, I come along and I go, okay, I want to see what you experimented with. I want to see if I come to my own conclusion that way. Right? I call that common sense. But it's not happening. And so um, the tie between pharmaceutical companies, the government lobbyists and all that, and insurance, there's a lot of mess there. Okay? Now, you don't have to get lost in all this, but it's important to know this. Uh, Another example of this chemical imbalance is, I hear this a lot with people I work with and, and help, clinical depression. Mark, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having depression. I don't think it's clinical depression. So we're creating this like differentiation now. We're separating it out. I get concerned about this being, oh, it's clinical. Okay, so now you need to get some professional help. Whereas just recognizing you're depressed lately, you're not going to get help. Okay, kind of creates this separation. All right, and it just continues to feed the chemical imbalance theory tied to medication. And to be honest, as a pastor, I have to a pastor's heart. I have to say it can prevent us from seeing the nuance of depression. Depression is a very general term. It's been taken into clinical now, so we lose the nuance of what depression or what was called melancholia uh, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. To lose the nuance. What I mean by nuance, the, there's, there's different aspects. For example, the Bible is rich in the subject of depression. Christians don't see it because it doesn't say, and so-and-so was depressed. But you see all throughout the Bible, a crushed spirit, a heaviness. My spirit faints. It's like my breath is gone. Uh, my eyes have grown dim, showing the honest expression of depression. Modern culture would jump into many of those days of heartache and sorrow or months and weeks of grieving and sadness and we go, "Hey, we need to get this we need to get this fixed." Depression is not always just something you diagnose and you just medicate away. Are we teaching people you're going through something? Yeah, but I have depression as though there's something wrong with you that needs to be eradicated. To just feel better. 
I propose, are you actually just as consideration? I'm not your doctor. I'm just your brother from another mother, but I have to bring this possible question. Is it you going through a season that you need to grieve through some things? Depression's actually a signal that some things need to be worked through. Anxiety may be a signal. You need to learn what it means to let perfect love cast out fear, to learn what it means to relate to God in renewed ways, to face fears in your life, to get equipped in that. Anxiety is a signal you're actually headed in a good direction, but you're learning how to work through your fears. We're taught this is unwanted. I got to get rid of it. Huge problem in our culture. I don't like feeling this way, so we just want comfort. And you get frustrated when you interact with God because God's number one concern is not your comfort. He's not trying to torment you. He's not making you sick. He's not sending torment against you. But he's also walking you through a journey, and he's walking with you to empower you so that you become strengthened in what you went through. What I've gone through and what I'm continuing to go through has become the grace on my life to be a blessing to you. But if I just wanted to feel better, you'd never have Mark DeJesus here sharing with you the things that I'm sharing with you here today. And I think I've, I'm big time concerned at our relationship to emotion and how we're, we're avoiding it. And so because of our struggles to deal with our feelings and emotions, and now we're, we're just always looking to medication for our mental health. We're taking a pathway that drives us to not feeling at all. And this leads to the issue of side effects. When your body takes in a chemical, okay, because medication has a lot of side effects to consider. When your body takes in a chemical, it fights to adjust to this new chemical thing that's being introduced to your body. It's not going, oh, I needed this. So this is what often manifests and what is called side effects. I remember as a side comment, years and years ago, I would say uh, mid 2000, like 2005, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I was involved a lot more in praying for people for physical healing, healing of diseases and laying hands on people, praying through and working through sickness and, 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 and with the, with the, with the um, desire to see more healings happen. And I notice a lot of people that are asking for prayer because when I would pray with them, it wouldn't just be pray, blah, 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 and move on. I'd sit down with them and, 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 and ask them about their journey and their life and interact and dialogue on this, which I believe is what we should be doing more in every area of our life. But here's what I notice: Many people were asking prayer for symptoms or uh, things they were manifesting in their body that was actually a side effect of the drug they were taking for something else. More than 95% of drug side effects go unreported. 95. And there are serious gaps and delays in getting relevant feedback on effects of pharmaceuticals once they're released to the market. Now, I have to say this over and over again because um, many people struggle with dark thoughts or suicidal thoughts and things like that. Psychiatric medication, uh, you often see a black box warning, which means there can be serious uh, even severe side effects. In top of the list, suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Even my daughter, when she sees she saw ads for depression medication, she's like, Dad, they just listed one of the side effects of depression is depression. Uh, taking depression medication is depression and suicidal thoughts. Right? And I'm like, honey, yes. <laughs> um, and I, and I, uh, people will write struggling with suicidal thoughts. First, my first thing is, uh, what medication are you on? In fact, when I see on the news someone who has died suddenly or something happened, uh, even suicide or some type of tragic death, uh, I go, what medications were they on? Now, I don't know. I'm just saying that's a question I ask. What medications were they on? And oftentimes in the news, that stuff kind of gets suppressed. I'm not going to get, you know, super conspiracy theorists here, but... I'm just starting with the truth. Side effects is a big deal. Uh, another big side effect is sexual uh, lib libido drive dropping. 
So now this is affecting relationships. So you may not feel as depressed. You may not feel as anxious, but now you don't have necessarily that drive of sexual intimacy with your spouse. Now, in my single years, I said to myself, well, you know, if that libido is not really happening right now, uh, you know, I'm not married yet. So at that time period, I, I definitely felt that like lowering of just that, that sense of like uh, for a man, just a sense of drive. It's just more like, uh, just more blah. It, the emotional blunting is, uh, is what I experience. That bland emotional state. You don't feel anxious. You may not feel as dark of depression, but you don't feel much at all. There's a quote here that I think is interesting. The person who takes medicine must recover twice, once from the disease and once from the, med- from the medicine. And if you've taken medicine, you, you probably know what I'm talking about. So you're going to have to take into consideration side effects from any drug or treatment that you're taking. With all medications, this is, this is reasonability here. With all medications, you have to weigh the possible benefits with the possible side effects. And the benefits need to outweigh, right? For example, I'm I'm on a medication right now for an autoimmune issue that I'm still working through. And there are side effects to it. But at this point in the journey, I was getting so much inflammation that it was even hindering my ability to just walk. So I'm still on my journey of learning, but I had to outweigh, I had to, the benefits of what it's helping outweigh the side effects. Okay. And so with every medication, this is a important thing to, to bring into your decision-making. So I'm going to integrate some questions and just give some feedback throughout this broadcast as I, as I speak to this issue and a question that was sent in is about this emotional blunting. Now, now just this is this is a very common thing that I will read. So this is not this is not just like one person. Here's here's what was sent into me. I've been diagnosed with major depression, anxiety, and OCD in September 2021 and have been on different medications. In October 2021, I ended a relationship with someone I was seeing after a few months. I'm currently on clomipromine, risperidone, and clonazepam. Okay? It's three drugs here. Now, clomipromine is an antidepressant. Risperidone is an antipsychotic. And clonazepam, which also, also known as clonopin, is a benzodiazepine. Okay? Here we got the, the three I'm talking about here. For much of 22, uh, I'm sorry, much of 2022, and up to now, I have no emotions. I'm not surprised. Why would anyone be surprised that you're extremely blunted? I cannot cry or feel joy. In worship, I have no emotional connection. So here's the question that's presented to me. It's not about the medication. Is emotional numbness the result of trauma or depression? No question about, hey, I I think the meds might be affecting me. Does it take time to restore emotions? That's the question that's sent in. Okay. Um, This is where we need to be educated and understanding because I'm finding many people working through mental health, they're passionate about it, are very ignorant about the medications that they're on and understanding them, understanding their effects, understanding being sober, about full picture. Get some understanding of how were they researched, how were they developed. Um, Keep in mind, too, that um, prescription drugs for other ailments could be affecting your mental health. So so I realized uh, when I, the the medication that I'm on for for an autoimmune issue, uh, it affects, I noticed my mood being affected. And I brought that to my doctor's attention. She was wonderful and said, listen, if we need to adjust and we need to, find other things. And then she mentioned to me, I had somebody else who went on a similar medication, started having suicidal thoughts and we're like, okay, well, we need to regroup here. Okay. So it's important even when you're, when you're looking at mental health, what other medications are you on? 
Are you experiencing side effects from them? It's just helpful to understand. Okay. Now, my feedback is any medication you take for anything, just, just a suggestion is keep a journal. Keep a journal of how you're feeling. And when you're off, journal it the day, write down the symptoms, and just kind of keep track. Because if somebody, a doctor or someone, a professional is working with you, having that can be helpful. Because maybe they can look at patterns when you're taking the drug, when it's happening, to help understand. Okay? Let's get back to where I was headed, and I'll address some more emails that came in along the way. Uh, Again, psychiatric medication is meant to be used for short-term use. It's not meant to be taken for the long haul. There isn't enough research for long-term use as being beneficial anyways. Uh, your body over time will, ad- will, will try to adjust to what you're taking in where it no longer has an effect and it can lead and many, many say, yes, this happened to me, where then you have to up the dosage, be prescribed more. Uh, getting off of medications often involve significant withdrawal issues depending on what you're taking and your particular body chemistry. And it makes sense because your body's adjusting to having this in your system and now it's adjusting to it not being there. And so I've, I've definitely seen, I've shared with you my concerns about benzodiazepines. Uh, there's a lot of this, many people looking for support because they're having an incredibly painful um, rocky road getting off of them. But even SSRIs, it's not just benzos. Uh, over the years, become more and more aware of people having withdrawal experiences from from coming off of them. I even, to be very honest and transparent, uh, I talk about autoimmune issues. I'm, I had such bad uh, joint pain that I was taking NSAIDs, a lot of NSAIDs, if, if you don't know what that is, uh, ibuprofen type of stuff. And I was taking a lot of it, and I was concerned about it, concerned about its effects on my stomach, my GI, and so forth. Uh, my doctor was keeping an eye on it with me. I was very, very concerned. I didn't want to do that. But I, again, I had swelling in my knees and ankles and feet and hips uh, getting so bad that I uh, couldn't walk. And so as I went on uh, a different drug to help, I was no longer as much in need of it as much as I was taking it. And interestingly enough, when I stopped, even that, just stopping NSAIDs, I felt, I felt weird for days. And that's just a common thing you can take over the counter. Some of you may benefit, and I'll put a link to it uh, if you are aware of Jordan Peterson. Uh, Many of you that listen to my broadcast, you're big fans of Jordan Peterson, or you appreciate what he's doing, uh, of his crisis that he went through. Very, very intense, and he had to go through very intense protocols, even going to another country to try to find help. His daughter, Michaela, has gone through Uh, many different aspects as well, too. She even writes about coming off of SSRIs. She has uh, some articles that um, you can can read. I'll link to those, and I'll mention those. I'll I'll mention that at the end of this broadcast. Okay. Now, I'm going to get to another uh, email that was sent in uh, by somebody that was was and is still going through the recovery journey. He says, I was on an antidepressant called Remeron, which is a a tetracyclic antidepressant. It made me drowsy, gave me very vivid dreams. At one time, I was dreaming that I was playing Monopoly with Nikki Six from Motley Crue and Blackie Lawless from Wasp. I woke up in the middle of the night furious because I was sure Nikki was cheating. (laughs) Things were going forward, and in January, I stopped taking them with permission from my doctor. Oh boy, what a month that was. My body started to produce a lot of adrenaline. And I slept 12 hours a night. And the only way to calm slightly down was a two-hour walk. Not sustainable. After a month, I talked to my doctor. We agreed to go back on them and slowly quit. At the same time, God had reconnected me with a brother who was a former drug addict. And he told me my symptoms were like coming off of drugs. Uh, Illegal drugs is what he's saying here. But you're having the same kind of thing with uh, prescribed drugs. The strongest thing I ever smoked was a Cuban cigar. So, but coming off of Remeron a few months later, I had to take something uh, easy to help with the symptoms. It worked, and towards middle of the summer, I was doing fine. Then the symptoms appeared again, a lot of adrenaline, racing mind, anxiety, fatigue. Me challenging old fears and beliefs probably didn't help, but I wanted to take healthy steps despite the symptoms. The medical society does not inform you 
well with this on prescription drugs. It hasn't done wonders for my healing journey, but I've decided to grow in this and stand my ground. I see that I have, I have an impact on the world around me, and I know God will use it for good. It's hard to stay mindful in the middle of this and break old patterns, but I didn't come this far to quit. How people come through this without Jesus is beyond my understanding. My heart goes out to you, brother, and, and courage, and I pray insight will, will help you as you continue to pave and pioneer the steps that you're taking. Another email, um, some, and some of this, some of the emails I get in might be um, language barriers, and some of it gets, gets, gets a, a lot too, so I'll, I'll try to cut it down a bit. But this one shows the um, obsessive compulsive aspect too that rises up in the search to try to find answers. Hi, Mark. I really like your videos. Watching them helped me a lot. I was doing great last year. And at the end of the year, I decided I'm going to get off medication because it frustrated me and I felt like it didn't help me. So the new year started in the first two weeks, I was okay. Then I started having a relapse and things got worse by time. And now even your videos don't help me to see the problem, but it makes me spin more. And this, this is why too, um, weaning and tapering needs to have supervision. So again, what I'm sharing with you Get, get professional expert supervision in this process. A lot of your videos is about finding the deeper issues, and that makes me triggered. And this is clearly someone with an obsessive compulsive because I talk about the problem is not the problem, so she's trying to find the deeper problem, but she's doing it out of like anxiety and like, I got to find what's the deeper, what's the deep, and that's not how this works. Uh, you'll have to, in understanding my material, the OCD healing journey, help it, uh, explain this a, a bit more. But um, I decided to write this down to you because I'm trying to find what's the problem, but I just can't find the answer and I keep feeling worse and spinning. So I mentioned that a lot of your videos about going deeper, this triggers me. The worst is that my mind is really against me and it triggers and, and it starts to say it triggers you because you're afraid of it and you avoid it, which makes me feel guilt and shame. Now, this is a, a classic example of someone who needs to understand their distortions and it takes time to understand. And many OCDers, particularly, exhaust clinicians because they stay in their, I mean, I get, I get emails that are the same broken record, no matter what I've said. A lot of people will write to me as though I never wrote back to them. And they, and they got the email because they're stuck in their distortions over and over and over again. And so this is a case of that. Um, spinning, beating yourself up, and it's because I'm a narcissist, stuff like that, and get angry, and it made me afraid of my emotions, and I'm still depressed. And um, in my experience, therapists can't tell you that it's not the real problem. I had two therapists, and both of them just followed the stories, which made me believe they're true. I feel stuck. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid my symptoms will worsen. I would like to go back to my life and enjoy it. And in mental health, you're never going back to your life. Why would you go in the past? We're not going back. We're going forward into a new life, but the new life is going to take new teaching. It's going to take new understanding. And so, um, so my mind says this wouldn't happen if I took meds, to which she says isn't true. That's not how meds work. Meds are tools, but if you take them like lifesavers, you will become dependent and not be able to get off them. That's why I made the decision. I will stop taking them. I hope you can say something to this. I'm really struggling. I don't know what to do. I start to feel tired that nothing seems to work. Well, let's, get, let's let go of nothing works because that's going to leave you stuck. Um, finding, I don't know if you're still on them or if you're still off of them. If you're off of them and you're moving forward, it's now getting tools, getting tools in your tool belt that you know how to utilize to work through the distorting filters that um, keep you in cycles. And your, your email definitely sounds uh, OCD. Uh, a member of the Healing and Freedom community, and uh, of course, you can join that at any time. I'm cultivating an online community of people that want to work through the issues of their life, to do the work. Uh, mentioned an awful experience with benzos, and, and my heart goes out to her. She said, in your upcoming broadcast, uh, podcast on psych meds. Can you please mention the dangers of taking benzos daily? They are being prescribed in ways that are contra uh, contraindicated even by the pharmaceutical companies. These meds are to be used for occasional use to stop a panic attack or for two weeks daily max during an extreme crisis. 
then two weeks to taper off. I was prescribed three milligrams Xanax daily for months, and it caused neurological damage. My heart goes out to you. I was cold turkey off this drug, causing even more damage. These drugs have to be tapered slowly. They're in the sedative hypnotic class of drugs, along with alcohol, barbiturates, and Z drugs, making them the most dangerous class of drugs to come off of due to possible seizure and death. Doctors are prescribing these drugs and have no idea how to get people off of them. I've received messages from people all over the world that I've met in support groups who can't get off SSRIs, mood stabilers, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, etc. These drugs are doing more harm than good and are drastically raising disability rates. Sadly, I've been on and off of almost every class of psychiatric medication. I can honestly say that I was never helped by any of them, but I did suffer many side effects. Like you, I'm not completely against meds. There are people out there that I believe genuinely need them in severe cases. It's obvious that these meds drugs are being overprescribed in most cases, though. I think the chemical imbalance theory is pure BS and a way to make money. My heart goes out to you, and, I, and I, my prayer for you is that what you've learned and what you've gained will be a blessing to other people, even in those communities where you're interacting, because many people need encouragement and support and know they're not alone. She says, uh, and I'll, I'll finish this because she said some more, studies actually show that most people that are dependent on benzos are taking them as prescribed and not addicts. And I'm, I'm taking that to mean they're not taking them like addicts in excess. They're actually taking them the way they're, that they're prescribed, but they're in a dependent state. This is why doctors are now doing slow tapers and not sending patients to rehab, which can cause more damage. I've been to rehab twice for this. Not fun. Thank you for sending that to me. And I pray it'll be an encouragement. I pray you'll be an encouragement to other people from what you've suffered that um, there'd be redemption in it for helping others. Uh, I'm going to give you a few more. Then we're going to get into what, is, what are some things that, some fundamental things we can understand in the journey. Uh, but we can all see, if we'll look, that medication use is increasing, but mental health statistics continue to rise. And so those in the higher ups, uh, why don't we go, hey, let's look at the stats. We need to reevaluate how we're approaching things. Nearly 70% of Americans are on at least one prescription drug for any health issue. This isn't just mental health. 70%. And more than half take two. When it comes to mental health medication, about 77 million are on some form of psychiatric medication. That's 23%. So one in four. One in every four people. And I'm concerned about our college students because college students um, have been um, the prescription uh, uh, psychiatric medication being prescribed to college students has been rising since 2007. Very concerned about that stage too because the brain is in the final stages of forming. There's a lot of prescribing of medication to children, to teenagers. And it's very concerning, very, very concerning because the body is in development. It's still forming. You, you don't even, they're, they're saying your brain doesn't even fully form to like 25. I don't know. I feel like for me, it was 30. <laughs> I think mine is still forming, but um, I'm, I'm concerned. I, I could get into other topics. I'm trying to keep it uh, focused in. I'm very concerned about the use of stimulants uh, being given Adderall and things like that. That's a whole subject in itself. Uh, my goodness. You talk about college students. Many, many OCD battles launch. They really explode in the college years. Um, concerned about stimulants, overuse of stimulants to try to uh, treat um, what is looked at as ADHD. And uh, we've gone very, very extreme in how we're dealing with the anxious uh, lack of attention and focus struggles that are going on. A lot of ADHD is, has an anxiety rooted in it. We're not dealing with the anxiety uh, that's there. So anyways, uh, overall health is declining as um, prescription drug use is rising. So uh, that's, that's, that's a sobering realization. 
um, prescription psychiatric medication can have a place, okay? Here's where I think, this is my opinion. This is my pastoral opinion. It has to do with stabilizing. Uh, one is to stabilize someone who doesn't eat, doesn't, perf- doesn't sleep at all, does, can't perform basic functions of life, right? To help stabilize. Even if it's emotional blunting, even if it's just kind of blunting things to go, okay, to then get the help that's going to work and be helpful. This is not, okay, now we're moving on. To stabilize someone who has severe PTSD, as uh, Van der Kolk talked about in his work, where um, they couldn't even get somebody to be able to work, they couldn't even stabilize them to even talk to them and work through issues. So it can help in that way. To stabilize someone who cannot function enough to be able to receive instruction or work through emotions. I told people in my congregation, it's very open about this. Don't just jump off your medication. Get teaching. Get, and if you're stabilized and you can pay attention, this is awesome. Let's work through thoughts. Work through emotions. Work through your relationship experience. Work through things so we can be taught. This is stuff that we're not taught growing up. It's not talked about in schools. It's not when really it should be talked about at home. And the church should be flourishing in how we navigate emotions because emotions are how we relate. I know those of you that go, no, no, we don't need to follow emotions. Even people who say they don't follow emotions, they still follow emotions. It's the emotion that's coming up about not wanting to follow emotions. It's an emotional response to not wanting to follow emotions. So um, remember, I told you the key is when the benefit outweighs the cost. You realize, okay, there are going to be some side effects, some things I may have to deal with, but, okay, and in all things, still get teaching, still get help, still get, uh, make yourself available to taking in resources, okay? Medication doesn't do the new thinking for you. You still have to learn the thinking. You still have to learn new ways of approaching life. You still have to face yourself. And we're all running from ourselves. We're hiding from God. We're hiding from ourselves. We're hiding from other people because we're afraid. And we're afraid because we have pain and emptiness and brokenness and fear takes over those empty places. So medication isn't going to do the thinking for you. I personally don't believe that natural methods are being emphasized enough. I'm going to talk about some areas I would, I would highly recommend. Um, but things like nutrition, sun, exercise, healthy relationships, they're like side things. Like, yeah, make sure you have that. No, those are the main things. Um, the thing is that you can't patent a natural substance. You can't patent running and walking. So there's no, there's no profit there. Now, I will say this about modern, there's, there is a modern fascination with um, physiology, chemicals. There's very famous people out there that highly influential people, they talk about, you know, biohacking, you know, your physiology. And uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate the insights. I've listened to many of them. Appreciate the learning in it. My one concern is, are we neglecting the relational world that needs development, healing, and maturity? That's all I say, because I do, I do sometimes see people go to the physical, okay, I'm not going to take pharmaceutical drugs, I'm going to do supplements, and then we're obsessed over supplements, and we're obsessed over this, and we're so heady, we're lost in that, we don't realize um, we're relational beings, and we got to work a journey. Now, I want to address, does being on medication mean you don't have faith? No, it doesn't mean you don't have faith, but remember what I mentioned about the placebo effect? Because <laughs> there's actually a part of it where faith actually is in play. Now, from a theological standpoint, the Bible does not forbid using medicine. Taking medicine does not mean you lack faith. Medicine and faith do not need to be on polar opposites, like you had to do one or the other. Taking medication does not mean you're refusing God. A lot of you black and white thinkers get into those ditches. Why does taking medicine have to interfere with the building of your faith and belief? Why can't you have faith and belief? And yet you have something you're going through that medicine for a time may be helpful. But remember the placebo effect. When we take medication, we're actually connecting to a realm of faith. We're trusting something's going to happen. We believe it'll have a positive effect. We hope for something. I was, I was deeply impacted by a strange video that I saw. And I put together a video on it. You may want to check it out and look it up. 
It's a video called What Three Jars of Rice Taught Me About My Words, Love, Hate, and Being Ignored. What three? Just type in Mark DeJesus in three jars. <laughs> uh, that was a fascinating. Ex- I, I saw a video on YouTube. Guy had three jars and uh, one jar of, of rice with with I think with water in it. One jar he was he was he was uh, nice to and kind to. He'd speak to the I, to the rice, uh, nice things. Then to the other jar, very mean things. And then the third jar, he just walked by it and it, and then and then act like ignoring it. And it was crazy what I saw. I said, let's do it with, with the kids. Let's just see. And if it's stupid, it's stupid. Who cares? It showed me how powerful it is in how we relate to ourselves. And um, so many people, they can take something and go, yeah, that saved my life. Or, or and or, I'm not going to say one or the other. You developed a very believing and hopeful mindset. Maybe you didn't even realize it. Maybe you just let yourself go into, okay, I'm going to take this. Do you know sometimes that's a step of faith? You know, I'm just going to step forward and I'm going to do this. In fact, that's a lot of what faith is. But anyways, that's a side. You can check that out. Um, but what I say is instead of beating yourself up over your faith, why not let your faith be developed in an all-round understanding and approach to your overall health. Now, I want to take a moment and address the subject of pharmacia. I have a lot to say about this, and I think it could be helpful because people write to me, or people will say, what about pharmacia? Christians will ask about this. And when they say this, this word pharmacia is taken mainly, usually when they refer to it, it's uh, written three times, I believe in the New Testament, but it's written here as the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh here are evident, you see, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. That word right there in the middle is what, if you look at the original language, it's the Greek word pharmakeia. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Okay, it does seem in this list, they're kind of grouped. You have the sexual ones up top, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Then you have idolatry, sorcery. So now we're talking about false religions. We're talking about occultic, uh, occult-like um, uh, spiritual pathways. Then you get into the relational breakdown, hatreds, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, and then you see in there drunkenness, which is part of the relational breakdown, right? I'm going to come back to that drunkenness word in, in, in a moment. Revelries, right? So you kind of see that. So you see idolatry and sorcery together because they do seem to relate to each other. Uh, the word sorcery, pharmakia, that's also translated witchcraft. It speaks of the use of administering a drug or a, like a poisoning, and it's connected to magical arts. So, uh, uh, false spirituality. It's often found in connection to idolatry, because I was a part of it, in the worship of idols and the connection of chemicals that they would take in the experiences. Okay? Um, so it's connection with the, the idolatry, um, the deceptions and seduction of idolatry. Sorcery involves the connection between taking in a substance and also a spiritual experience you're, ga- you're engaging in. In idolatrous practices, pagan worship and occultic experiences, mind-altering substances are often used as a part of the practice. Uh, that's one thing also there's also sexual sin that's tied in. So in the works of the flesh, the sexual sins, and then secondly, you see the idolatry and sorcery because the sexual sins are tied into it. They, they, they relate here. Whenever you see witchcraft or occultism, you often find fornications, adulteries, uh, all kinds of sexual uncleanness also there as well too. Okay? Now, I did, I've done a lot of research on this word, and I'll be honest, years ago, I was, I was ministering to people from a more deliverance emphasis. 
and, and, and was working that kind of oh, helping people to repent, renounce, break agreement, uh, not hokey, weird kind of stuff, but just working through uh, deliverance protocols. Um, and what I saw in a lot of the writings of deliverance ministry manuals and stuff, this pharmacia was in there. It was this umbrella term that was used that any chemical you took in your body, including medicine, was pharmacia, and you're getting the devil in. And honestly, this got way out of hand. It caused people to become paranoid. Um, there, there is this connection that people can make that the, the Greek word pharmacia and sorcery is the influence behind modern medicine. And, and I, I want to be cautious in just kind of creating that direct connection because in, in, in all the reading and research, I'm, 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 I'm not seeing that connection there. Although I will give you one concern. At the end of this segment, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you my, my one biblical concern. So they kind of say, like, anything you're taking is pharmakia. I don't think that that tie-in is, is fair or it's even theologically accurate. Because now you're condemning people for even taking aspirin. Now you're, you're, you're condemning people for taking anything. Uh, you can get into, you take a supplement, you can condemn people for taking that. If you go that route. So I felt like it led people to, you should just be healed in God and there should just be nothing else as a part of it. You do see herbs and things like that used in scripture. Um, the Bible doesn't forbid the practice of using something medicinal. Now, f- stay with me here. It, it seems that the true definition of it, it ties to spiritual experience. Okay? I get more concerned discernment wise about another word in this list it's drunkenness and i'll tell you why it's not going where you think it's going the word drunkenness speaks of intoxication that's what it really means and it it, it can speak of an altered state of consciousness is really what intoxication is you're in an altered state i'm concerned today about the fascination in our modern world with drugs that produce an intense altered state of consciousness, a disconnect from self. So for a while, uh, we've seen it in the use of marijuana use, where um, there's kind of two pathways that take, that take place with marijuana. One is, is it makes anxious people more paranoid. So if you have a tendency or propensity towards that, it makes you more paranoid. It makes people that are more passive and more, they just kind of avoid, they don't deal with things, don't take as much initiative. It makes them even more passive. Okay. Each state is kind of taking us out of sobriety. We also saw historically where LSD was being experimented with. We saw the wave of 60s and 70s of what that was producing, what that was taking place. And people were having spiritual encounters. This, was, this is even a concern I saw in the supernatural community of Christianity, signs and wonders community, where you see people having, oh, I had this encounter, I saw Jesus, I saw an angel, I saw this and that. And when you ask them about their history, they have a history of drug use. And I remember being in some of these services, they're telling their stories of angelic encounters. I saw this, I saw that, and I talked to Jesus, and he was in my room, we hung out. And uh, I remember bringing people with me, and we were just kind of, listening, checking this out. What was this all about? And a, a guy who's with me goes, hey, this dude's talking about, uh, this, is like a, I, this reminds me of one of the drug trips that I took way back in the day. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have this, this wave of experimentation that's going on and people having spiritual encounters. I'm concerned about altering our state, having these elevated encounters and what we're opening our spirits up to. I have concern about it. If that makes you spin and spiral, it's not my heart. I'm trying to lead us into sobriety. I'm digging into deep stuff here here today. And this is stuff I'm interacting with and seeing in people's lives and stuff you're seeing interacting with in people's lives too. Um, There's also studies that are showing people that are having these kind of psychedelics, uh, a high percentage of them having drug-induced psychosis leading to bipolar and schizophrenia. That's a concern as well, too. I am also concerned about people being disconnected in an altered state of consciousness from 
not being able to just deal with their emotions. I want to encourage and teach people in their current state to learn how to work through their emotions in a fruitful and helpful way. It takes work. It takes a journey. It takes practice. It takes patience. But I see this fascination with going towards uh, hallucinogenics, uh, going to psychedelics like psilocybin, uh, drugs like ketamine, MDMA, which is ecstasy. I'm concerned about people needing that to then deal with their emotions. A, because of what it could open them up to spiritually. B, what now I need to do that to get to that emotional place. I think the best thing to help someone emotionally is first develop trust. And in trust, and those of you that are compassion workers and therapists, I recommend we got to develop trust and rapport. We develop rapport to be able to speak into areas, and it takes work. Many, many therapists, by the way, the people that you work with, if they're, any, if they're, any, uh, if they're effective in their work, you may find it takes six months or longer to just get a footing if you're meeting every week into getting to know the person. And, you know, we go, oh, that's too long. And this, and this is the journey, folks, that we're on. Okay, there is one aspect of pharmacia that I see spiritually happening that's problematic. And this kind of gets into a deep dive and this <laughs> maybe deeper than some people want to go, is how much pharmaceuticals have risen up into a place of power and influence. Again, I'm not against medication. But the influence of power is very, very concerning where I see modern pharmaceutical companies operating in connection with modern business and then also government and the overall power structure and influence over modern healthcare in general. With this power, there's corruption and deception at massive levels. And I know I've said a lot of things already in this, in this broadcast that may, that may get me in trouble and may push down the views that happen in the video, whatever. I'm creating this to help people in their journey. But seeing Big Pharma rise up to this place, and we saw this, we've seen this in recent years, we've seen this in COVID, and to the point where I couldn't even mention COVID or vaccine, and I would see my videos drop in views. And now that's being confronted and exposed of things we were lied to and things that we were not told and, and downright deceived. The business uh, pharmaceutical connection rises up in power with no accountability, no admitting of wrong, and no honesty in what's really going on, happening at massive levels. So anyways, when I'm reading in Pharmakia, I'm reading this verse in Revelation 18. In verse number 23, look at, the, look at the business and sorcery connection here. For your merchants, okay, this is the, those who business and trade and running all that, were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. And, and I, not to get deep into the, the COVID you know, controversy but there was mass deception covering the earth. And this is a, a speaking to, uh, there's a picture of Babylon here and not to get, try to get too deep into revelation. Interesting of it. For by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. So is it a sin? Is it pharmacia? If you take, a drug. No, but beware of the sorcery of how they are communicating because I believe it's a it's, it's somewhat of a form of sorcery and just adds a chemical imbalance, just take this and, and you're fine. It's like creating a, a bewitchment, a hypnosis and then it becomes religious and how they stand with it and if you don't agree with it or if you ask any questions I mean you can lose your job. You can lose friendships. It's dividing people. I've said my piece about that. Let it be for your discernment. And so what I want to share here is to be a student of your journey. First and foremost, be a student. Learn. And allow yourself to don't go, ah, I don't have time for it. This is your life. This is your health. You need to learn. We live in a day where there are 
facets of the medical community that say, just do what we say, just take this and don't question. Kind of reminds me in early church history where the church said, you don't read, don't read your Bible. You don't need to read it. We'll tell you what it says. And thank goodness there was a reformation brought about to put the word of God into people's hands. And I am always going to be a proponent of you be a learner. You be a learner. Don't just listen to, to narratives. When you listen to my teachings, go research. When you, when you see my biblical teachings, go read your Bible. In fact, everything I'm sharing here today, you go, you research, you learn. That's empowerment. To just do what I say because I said it and don't question it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's removing the freedom and liberty that you've been given by God to be able to discover subjects for yourself. Do some research, do some reading. And I know many of you, you're obsessive compulsive and you do, you do reading and research out of disturbance. No, don't do, do research out of disturbance. I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out because I'm having panic and anxiety. No, no, no. Sober. I want to learn. I want to understand. You may not be a doctor, but you can learn a whole lot by being a student of your temple because you're going to have to advocate for yourself. I want to empower your ability to be a student for yourself. God's given you liberty. Liberty is a powerful word. It's the ability to freely make decisions, to, to live and move, to have your being. That you're not being hovered over by God. Go left when you should go right. Uh, I'm going to punish you. Uh -uh. You actually have the ability to make choices. And in it, you may learn, okay, this didn't help, and you adjust. In it, may you may learn, like the person who wrote to me, I was on these meds, and I got off, and I did this. And, and you learn in the process. I'll read a, um, I, uh, well, before I get into that, that section, I'm going to read another, um, this is another email that was sent in to me. This kind of puts into picture many of the things I've talked about and shared over the past couple hours. I know you can't give medical advice, but do you have any resources or thoughts for someone who's wanting to reduce or eventually eliminate OCD meds? I've been on Zoloft, an antidepressant, for 20 years, and have added Risperidol, which is an antipsychotic, a couple years ago. I do know they have helped me significantly over the years, but I'm wondering if there are things I can do myself that could replace the medication's rule. Now, the question I would first ask is, what tools are you learning? What practices are you putting into place? Um, that would be my, my biggest question because that's what you have to develop. That's why in the OCD healing journey, I talk about the seven distortions. Talk about nurture. How do you relate to God? How do you relate to yourself? Major learning journeys. Um, I wasn't, I grew up in the era where Christians were shamed for taking medications for mental health. Yep, that, that happened. The, the, good, the good news is the shame is lessening, but we still got to talk soberly. In the churches I attended in my youth and 20s, it didn't acknowledge mental health issues. They were a lack of faith or demons, right? They focus on just that kind of silver bullet. This is it. You should be fine. What's wrong with you? Get over it. That's, I faced a lot of that too. It took a lot of desperation for me to make the choice to begin medication 20 years ago. So that's putting you early 2000s, 2003. I wasn't formally diagnosed with uh, OCD until 10 years ago. And I've, okay. so. That's interesting. If you're, if you're just, okay, 10 years ago, and I've learned a lot about it since then. Yeah, so 10 years. Yeah, so, so it takes a while. It takes a while to learn how OCD affects you. Your resources and others have helped me navigate intrusive thoughts and the blanket of depression. The church, by the way, doesn't understand intrusive thoughts. They treat it as like the devil or something you got to like yell at and fight back. Uh, it doesn't help people. Although I still have a lot of healing that needs to happen with God as a loving father. There was some church abuse that happened in my late teens that really crippled my walk with God and perception of him. I would say so. I'm going to link at the end for some couple links that I found interesting and helpful. Uh, obviously, beware of going cold turkey and finding a doctor who can work with you tapering. But I would want to make sure that you have some good tools that is showing improvement in how you relate to your thoughts. And that's what I'd like to get into right now, if that's all right. Um, being a student of your journey is, um, we're going to have to first welcome a multifaceted understanding of mental health, okay? Many Christians have simplistic silver bullet perspectives. Just get saved. It's just a demon. Just pray more. It's a chemical imbalance. Um, even simplistic things like, oh, it's just a chemical thing. 
it's not just a physical issue. It's not just a spiritual issue. It's not just a soul issue. It's all, okay? You're multifaceted. My encouragement is focus on where Jesus focused, on the heart. So slow down. Let's learn to live from the life of the heart. And what what connects to the heart is let's look at the, the areas of your heart that have been impacted, the highs and lows of life. What does love mean to you? Do you connect well to love? What does it look like to be loved? Okay, now we're entering into the journey of heart healing. Now, if you do go on medication, uh, are you willing to continue to do the work for your journey? That's what I say. Some sober questions you may want to ask. Uh, are you willing to make lifestyle changes? Are you willing to embrace the learning and practice? Um, are, you ma- are you willing to make room in your day for journaling and writing down and reading? Are you willing to make room for relationship practicing? Uh, or do you just want a quick fix to go back to your life? Okay. These are important things to, to consider. I have um, another email that was written into me. I have been watching your videos on fear and OCD and anxiety. And so many times I almost have them memorized. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty impressive. I think the two underlying issues with me is definitely fear and OCD. I have had losses in my life that have contributed to this, especially the sudden death of my mother. Okay, that's, that's an important thread in your journey to be aware of. I was also in a neglectful and emotionally abusive marriage for over 20 years. Okay, we now have two big things. These are not little. These are major things. My therapist is telling me, My OCD is shrouding my ability to use tools she is giving me to try and rewire my brain. Yes, because OCD blocks from seeing the brokenness. You just told me two major areas, and I go, yep, that's going to take some time and processing of healing. OCD is going to go, no, it's about the unpardonable sin. No, it's about my salvation. No, it's about the sexual thought. No, it's about this other thing. No, it's about cleanliness. No, it's about this. No, it's about that. That's a big part of distortions. So your therapist is getting frustrated. And this is often what therapists do because they may not feel they can tell you, hey, uh, you're not listening. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit more, le- I'm a little bit more, I'm, I'm leaning towards, hey, uh, I'm not going to argue with you here. Do you want help or not? <laughs> My distorted thinking and so, so forth and so on. She's recommending I get on medication at least temporarily so that I can make progress. Now, medication is not going to help your distortions. Medication is going to do what I shared before. Would it help? Maybe to help your emotions get get, um, blunted a little bit so you can actually slowly walk through what you need. I know you had mentioned that you were on medication for a while, but it numbed you. Yes. So you navigated a way to work through your OCD, fear, and anxiety in a way to manage it. It's not just managing it, it's working through it. And uh, in a lot of it, you can overcome. Now, it's a lifelong journey. I'm always, I'm always living in what I've learned, right? Um, so anyway, did the medication help you initially to help rewire your brain? No, medication does not rewire your brain. No, it doesn't. And this, see, these are the things that people believe. No, it, 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 it doesn't. Uh, you still have to do the work. I'm so tired of letting fear and OCD and anxiety control my life. Right, because it's exhausting. Anxiety and OCD is exhausting. I know that depression is also tied into this. Yeah, probably is. I just want to wake up with a new perspective. Wanted you all to hear the examples. I just want to wake up. Now, we all would love that, but there's no glory in that. When you go through a battle and you have to learn to fight through, walk through, at times deeply struggling, and you get some victories, you own it. It becomes who you are, a part of who you are now and what you offer other people. Um, I just want to wake up with a new perspective. I want to feel joy and hope. And life, life doesn't work that way. We have to learn how to cultivate joy, how to cultivate peace. Um, you want to feel, you want to feel life. I fear death and even getting older. Basically I fear everything. Okay. So that shows me your relationship to fear needs renewal and teaching and practice. I have no control over, and most certainly I do not do well with uncertainty. There's your OCD distortions. I'm in a vortex that I can't seem to get out of, but I want to desperately. 
there is victimization, self-pity, and everything going on with me. And I don't know which comes first. Maybe it's just a chain effect and everything's linked together. When I spiral, I just can't seem to get out of it. Some days are better than others. Any advice at all? Well, I would first recommend you go to my topics page. If you go to markdehasius.com, if you're asking me of stuff that I teach and develop, go to my topics, see that link, topics, go to that page, click on heart, healing, and freedom. And there are three audio links at the top. It says, start here, go there. That's what I would consider that help. That will help you focus in on what you're needing to focus on right now in this journey. Uh, any advice on temporarily being on medication? Because I don't think this is a solution. My son and his girlfriend are telling me it would just be temporary as I'm working in psychotherapy to learn new ways to think and rewire my brain. And then I can slowly get off the medication. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Also love your videos. They're so relatable. Thank you. Many blessings to you as well, too. So if you're on medication, just don't per stop pursuing growth, healing, uh, and transformation. The research has shown that if you do take medication, it works best in conjunction with therapeutic help, counseling, CBT. Uh, and, and by the way, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, a big part of it is helping you to see your distortions. So uh, if you can get to that point and, be, and welcome how I'm seeing this is distorted, it can help you to start walking new pathways and how you relate to your thoughts. Um, but many people, maybe they, their symptoms start to die down, so then they stop getting help. They stop going to therapy altogether. And until, until then, years later, they're having more symptoms, and they run back to counseling. We don't like homework. We don't like doing the work <laughs> and those kind of things. Um, it takes time to work through how we think and the damage that's been done to our hearts, the trauma we've been through. Now, there's one possible option I'll give you that you could consider. I have a friend of mine that I know, and he used it for his son, and you could consider this too. It's a website called Gene Sight. It's, uh, I don't have it to put it up on the screen, but uh, G-E-N-E-S-I-G-H-T dot com. I'll try to remember to link it in the notes. And what they do is they do genetic testing to see which medications you may respond to better. And that could be helpful. Again, don't stop doing the work that you need to do, okay? I'm gonna give you stuff that over the years of my work with people and helping my own journey in working through stuff, uh, all of this, I encourage to be a part of your tool belt. Um, as fundamental areas that you're always navigating through. Do you want to know what number one thing in mental health is that I put at the top of the list? Number one. Number one, because if this is off, it's like dominoes. Number one, learn to get fruitful sleep. Top of the list. If I wanted to be really cruel to you and get you messed up, I could do it in two days. Just sleep deprive you. That's all I got to do. Get someone sleep deprived. So those of you that are moms and you have, you have kids, any parent, new parent, when I, when I talk to them, and many of you have seen me do this, I'll ask them, hey, uh, by the way, how are you sleeping? Because with newborns and feeding schedules and all that, it, it messes up sleep, and then that impacts mental health. A good night sleep. One or two days of sleep deprivation can put you in a state like you're drunk, So this is really important to find resources, learning. I, I like reading and learning. So that's a big part of my life and, and my journey. But find what's getting in the way. Uh, have a basic uh, pattern of sleeping. When you go to sleep, get rid of uh, lights and devices and stuff like that. Uh, have some time of breathing. Get all lights, uh, you know, uh, curtains, you know, closed. Get it dark as possible. Have it cool. Um, beware of like too much eating at night and too much stimulation, have a practice maybe even of, God, uh, I release my cares to you. I give them to you. Uh, good prayers for going to bed are more letting go prayers than they are uh, trying to intercede for stuff. <laughs> you know. Um, but fruitful sleep, top of the list. Two, and this costs you nothing, get outside. Get sun. Get out there. When you first wake up, Try to peek out there if you have a back porch, back deck, back area, front area, wherever the sun is coming up. Try to first thing, just get some of that sun in your eyes. Get it on your face. Even if it's cold out, just 
as you're breathing in the cold air or, or whatever, just take a moment to let the sun hit you and find as much time as you can to get outside, get sun, get that vitamin D, go out for walks, breathe in nature. This stuff is not just uh, for woo-woo people. This is for all of us. This is mental health. I was very, very frustrated that uh, during COVID, they were just telling us to just go inside and stay inside. No, 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 no. We need to be outside. Our bodies need that. If you're in an office a lot, you need even more time that you get outside. For example, when I finish this recording, I'm going right outside because this studio has zero daylight. And I do that on purpose, so it's easier to set up lighting and stuff like that. Um, so I don't have to worry about where the sun's hitting in and all that, right? I'm going to go right outside. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to exhale. I'm going to pause. I'm going to take in the sun. Uh, and, and, a, and a practice that I uh, utilize every day now is just going for walks. I want to encourage you every day, move, do something. For me, it's walking. Some, sometimes I get it a little bit into running. I'm not a big running fan. I follow Jesus and Jesus walked. So go ahead and walk. Slow pace. You don't have to walk far. Just do what you can handle. What I recommend is take your physical activity and just keep building on it. Do it based on enjoyment. Find things you enjoy. Don't go, I'm going to go to the gym every day. Do you enjoy going to the gym? Some people do. Um, I prefer, I don't really like the, I got to drive. I got to go there. You know, I like being able to do something at my house, at my home. So we set it up that way. I've got a little, a little weight area and I love walking in my neighborhood. It's a time I connect to God. I, I recalibrate my thoughts. It helps my mood. Take your physical. And now if you're somebody who doesn't do anything, don't go, I'm going to run a marathon. You may go, okay, uh, every day I'm going to go walk to the corner and back. I know some pe- I, I, many people actually I've talked to, they're inside almost all the time. Some have um, multiple chemical sensitivity. They have adrenal exhaustion or, or, or whatever. And uh, I go, just stretch the membrane. Okay, you, you don't go outside. Uh, get outside for five minutes. Okay, tomorrow, 10 minutes. Go walk to the corner. And then after a month, go walk to the next corner and build on that. That's what I did. That's what helped me. And now I go for a full hour. I actually have to go, oh, I got to get back. I got some things I got to do because I'd actually like to go longer. Uh, I'm enjoying it so much. When you connect to enjoyment, um, that helps you to repeat habits and behaviors. Another thing, this is, this is a big one, is work on your nutrition. It's been one of the greatest helps for me. You can erode your mental state with toxic foods, constant sugar, processed ingredients. That's a, that's a very easy way to just really mess your mood up. Many of you are having allergic reactions to food or certain foods that don't serve your energy well. You can often tell by after you eat, kind of the, the sluggishness that, that goes on. Uh, many of you know for me, intermittent fasting and a ketogenic diet has been the best for me so far. Uh, I'm open to improvements of that over time. That, that, that's not something you got to do. I just, my encouragement to you is, is to find ways to clean up your diet. When I recognized this in my journey, I'm trying to remember what year it was. I want to say it was about 2013. So we're talking 11 years ago as of this recording. And I was pastoring at the time. And I said to my church, listen, I'm straightening some things out in this. And I want to create an invitation for you to experience your own healing in this. So I, I did a Sunday night series on nutrition. I don't hear of pastors doing that. I don't know. Maybe they're afraid of it or I don't know. They're, uh, who, who knows? I was like, let's dive in. And I taught about the basic fundamentals. And then I actually, in the last session, walked them through some potential detoxes they could do, uh, some, some r- protocols they could do. I even brought some foods that were great, that were um, uh, 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 helpful for more of a, of a detoxing, processed ingredient, stuff like that. Um, it was fun. It was a fun time, and many people benefited from it. And I would guess some of them are still on their journey of what they gained from that. Because I looked at our church, and we are a very expressive church. We would, you know, uh, lift our hands, dance, celebrate. We did a lot of celebrating fun. Uh, you've heard me talk about that in other broadcasts. But I'd look and i go, we just did like, like a couple motions, and people are out of breath. Like we are really out of shape and unhealthy. And so um, 
I really encourage my church, like no condemnation, no condemnation, but I want to be a help to you. And so, um, man, I just, <laughs> uh, I would encourage getting some, uh, I, I encourage w- at least one time in your life, get uh, very extensive blood work done. You can get from like an integrative functional doctor where they'll look deeper at your levels and, and, and at least one time do that. Uh, it's like a blood work panel, uh, a cortisol stress check with it, like check your saliva. And then, um, they, uh, check your poop. (laughs) Those, those, those areas do it at least once in your journey to just give yourself a good picture of where you're at. Do what you can afford. Cause like I said, these, it it can get expensive and sometimes that's frustrating. Um, but you may need to get some hormone understanding, um, and, and, and do just one thing at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself. Beware of obsession and overwhelming yourself. But um, find where you're at in your diet and go, what's the next step I could take? You know, for me, I remember when I did um, some juicing and our church was doing a fast and stuff like that. And I know some people, many people have uh, um, unhealthy relationships to fast, but it was a great experience for me. Uh, learning how to juice and smoothies and stuff did that. It's not, it's not necessarily a way to live, but it can be a way to, to kind of clean up. And that was a, that was my entry into going, okay, now what do I want to do permanently as a far, as a part of my daily, daily routine? Okay. Enough of that. You, you, I can talk more about that other times. The, the, the hallmark of mental health Im- involves our emotions and your emotions are developed and enhanced by your relationships. So I want to encourage all of us, stay connected to the meaningful relationships. There's some relationships you may need to let go of. But the ones that are meaningful, that you treasure, that are important to you. You say, I won't have any. We're going to have to find some. You have to be open to them because that's where a lot of healing is. Identify those meaningful relationships, nurture them, treasure them, invest in them. Don't get lost in busyness because relationship practice is medicine to the heart and soul. In person, if possible. Let it be in person kind of stuff. If you got to do call. Now, for me, I have a few friends. None of them live in my area. They're in other states, other areas. So I got to stay in touch that way. But every now and then, we try to have in person visits, those kind of things, because it's, it's so important and meaningful. Start with where you are, treasure what you have that's meaningful. And if you need to build new ones, Go to the store and have a conversation at the deli counter. You know, when you're checking out, the ladies, you know, the guys checking you out. Have uh, when I when I mean checking out, I mean, dude, dude. I don't mean like checking you out. You, you get what I'm saying? Um, maybe have a conversation. How, how are you doing? How are things going? Practice relational interaction. Social interaction is medicine for mental health. Healthy social interaction, having healthy input of people that know you and get you. And you're willing to take it in, right? And you're also, but you you learn how to be compassionate and gracious with other people. I encourage you get help that works well for you. This is going to take experiment, practice. Don't get hung up if somebody doesn't work out or therapy didn't work out. Find avenues that speak to your battles effectively. A lot of people find my approach effective. A lot of people don't. So if you love me, there's a lot of people that don't. <laughs> It's okay. I'm not for everybody, but I'm called to speak to people. And, and, and I say, God, bring people down my path that can benefit from my journey and where I've gone and how I approach things. I, I work with people who they also see a therapist or um, where you listen to my teachings. Many therapists recommend my teachings. They go, hey, you need to get Mark's teachings, get his book. It's awesome. Because it's all these aspects of tools that are going to help. Therapy, coaching, reading, learning, training, getting aware of your distortions, getting um, more specific. If you've had trauma that you need to work through, understanding how that's affected your life. From a practical standpoint, develop meaningful routines that anchor you in faith, hope, and love. Like daily things. Don't do them because you have to, because you're going to be punished by God. Nope. Because you enjoy them. Every day I read and I, and I, and I have, I have routines. I enjoy it. Every day I have certain routines and I found 
delight. I, and this is where God, even in depression, where desire has been conceived, because I looked for areas where I can have delight, enjoyment. So for many of you, you're in depression. You're needing to look to, like the Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire is conceived, it's a tree of life. Many of you are needing to connect to desire, but you may actually have to have to go through some grieving and, and go through some stuff to get to connected to desire. Uh, so some, some suggestions. Gratitude journals is something we do in our home. As a family, we get together. When I go get the gratitude journals out. We sit for 10 minutes. We go, all right, right. What you're grateful for today. We go around the room. We share. And every time it lifts the spirit of, every, of all of us in our family. And do it. If you're not married, don't have a family you're living with, do it by yourself. Uh, self-talk. Have a routine of affirmations you develop. Uh, that you lovingly speak over yourself and remind yourself of. Expressions of praise and worship. Kick on some praise music and cut a rug and dance around a little bit. Well, I'm not Pentecostal. Who cares? Just go, No one's telling you to have to be, uh, go to a Pentecostal church. Just cut a rug up a bit. Have some fun. That's in our Sunday night lives. We try to incorporate that because it's like we got to loosen up. You may benefit from having a simple habit of communion. Uh, on a regular basis, been seasons in my life where I took communion maybe every day for for like a week or or a season or during certain seasons. I just have a pause where you're reflecting on God's goodness. Focus on the enjoyment, uh, taking stillness. And I have a, a video I did on on biblical meditation, learning how to get still and just calm your heart and um, learn to connect to the love of the Father. Now I'm going to close with with this: is that be journey minded in all this. You got to. Most people I interact with do not have a journey mindset at first, and it works against them. You can always continue to pray for God, do this work, pray for breakthrough, pray for healing, but keep a journey mindset as you do that. I want to encourage you to celebrate small steps and small victories. There's no victory too small. Any little thing, because in, in our mental health struggle, we have black and white, all or nothing thinking. And it works against us. It's either I'm going to be all healed or nothing at all. And it's beating you up. It's sabotaging your journey. Celebrating steps, it builds momentum. Because when you celebrate this step, it leads to more steps. It leads to more steps. It leads to more steps. And builds momentum in your life. And many of us need momentum of encouragement. But in all things, I want to encourage you, be patient with your journey. There's no quick fixes. So when people tell you that, be, let it be a red flag. Let patience have its work, the Bible says. And even if something doesn't seem to help and you learn, you go, hey, I learned. I learned through that. In all things, let patience have a work in your journey. Now, I did mention I was, I was going to show you further resources. I will, I will put a link to the gene uh, link that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the article by Michaela Peterson is called How We Cured, Treated, Suicidal, Akathisia. And so if you wonder what akathisia is, explain it. It's there. Uh, she talks about coming off of SSRIs after being on them for 10 years. Uh, by the way, she was very negatively impacted by mold and did not know it. So there's stuff there too. Uh, many, many, some of the links here I'm going to share with you, it's a lot, not necessarily doctors, it's some people that have just been through it and uh, learning along the way. One site is called Surviving Antidepressants. Another one is the Withdrawal Project, and then there's a, a, a website, RxISK, which uh, documents the side effects of drugs. You can go in and search them. Uh, I found those to be very, very, very interesting. How was this helpful to your life and to your journey? Again, this was an extended deep dive. It was an honor to share this with you. I am your brother from another mother. If this was a blessing to your life, do me a favor, click that like button, click subscribe. Please share it with other people that could benefit. And would you do me a favor, if it's helped you, would you consider a one-time support donation or become a regular supporter on a monthly basis of supporting these broadcasts? I put a lot of heart, blood, sweat, and tears into this, and it's an honor to be able to share it. Those who you really uh, resonate with my DNA, you may want to consider investing in joining the Healing and Freedom Community. I'm teaching on the OCD Healing Journey book in course format, and it's a real joy to be able to share that with you. But Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, 
This is your brother from another mother saying, I'll be back with more insights for your healing and freedom journey. Gonna have to give my voice a break after talking for two and a half hours straight. But in the meantime, I'm out.